Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Chatting with Nuts. This is episode 26, and I am uh, relieved to be here. Uh, if I don't ever have to look at another piece of real estate in my life, if I never have to house hunt again, it'll be too soon. I'm over it, uh, but I'm happy to be here tonight because we're going to talk about some bookish things, uh, entertainment things. We'll probably talk about uh, our hobbies, jiu-jitsu, mountain biking, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and that's because I'm accompanied by a really awesome guest here, and that is Steve from Steve Talks Books. How you doing, man? Good. How are you doing, Jimmy? I'm all right. I'm a little tired, but we, we both said we took naps before this to kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, prep ourselves. And for me, it's just like if I I'm walking houses right now, and I think I've walked like, I don't know, 15 houses in like wow. 10 days. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired, but I'm also out of the reading slump. I was in a bit of a slump and now I'm out. So that's nice. I have something to look forward to. And uh, I just love these chats, man. I really look forward to this stuff. <laughs> so how did you get out of your reading slump? How did you, uh, how did you kind of break free? <clears throat> well, sometimes you got to brute force it. <laughs> sometimes you just got to bite down on the mouthpiece and swing. And that's what I did. Um, you know, obviously with what we do, like I have to keep reading. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I, I actually am a pretty big, uh, I'm, 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 I believe in pushing through things because sometimes whenever you don't uh, feel like doing something, that's whenever you get the best experience. This happens all the time with working out for me. The days that I don't want to go to the gym and I go best workouts of my life. You'll always regret not going, but you'll never regret going. Same thing with books, right? Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't work for everyone. And sometimes I think it is healthy to just say, I'm not reading uh, yeah. but that. It's not, not in me. It's not in me. It's part of my routine. If I break my routine, I get grumpy and my wife will not have any of that. So <laughs> that's not good. Yeah. What's your, go what's your go-to whenever you're in a slump? Uh, short stories. Oh, I noticed that you read, uh, I think it was Richard Neal's short story. Is that right? Yeah, I did um, Michael R. Fletcher's uh, A Collection of Obsessions. Yeah. In February, yeah. It's, it's, they're, they're short, so it feels like you accomplished something, so it doesn't take you forever. And you finish the story, and it's like, all right, this is kind of cool, because I, I feel like I did something, and it was like 10 pages. But it's a mental <laughs> thing, you know? No, for sure. You know, uh, a lot of times, especially when I'm looking for like short fiction, I reach for the Cy King short story collections, Night Shift and things like that. Uh, and also George R. R. Martin's actually written a lot of really nice short fiction as well. Um, I just wrapped up my 80th reread of Duncan Egg or whatever it was. And those are the ones I usually it was it was nice because I went through a slump and then I got to read that like it was on the it was on the docket. Right. But that's probably what I would have reached for anyways, just because I love it so much and it's so cozy to me. Um I always say that in the Hobbit are my two cozy reads. Hmm. So do you ever feel guilty rereading things when you feel like you should be reading for the channel? Do you feel like you're never. cheating at the channel? No, never, man. Cause so here's the thing. I would feel bad if I, um, if that was like the only thing I was doing, I could see that being a bit of a problem, but with my favorite rereads and the stories that I'm drawn to, dude, I just feel like I always find something new to talk about and I'm always changing as a person. So the books are reading me as they always say, and I come at it with a different perspective, like this reread of A Song of Ice and Fire. I think I had more notes on A Feast for Crows than any of the other books. And that has been notoriously my least favorite of the five. But coming out of this time, I think I might have enjoyed it the most. So it's hmm. just, you know, it's just strange. It, um, but with that said, <laughs> I'm fighting the urge to start another A Song of Ice and Fire reread right now because I can't do it again. Like, I can't do it again. <laughs> I always tell myself, I say, uh, I'll wait till wins. If wins ever comes out, I'll reread it. And I just break the rule every time. So I've just stopped saying it. I've stopped making pledges because just like George, I can't keep a promise. So I just, you know. Poor George. Right? Poor George, he's, man. He's in, he's in a really tough spot. Yeah. I, you know, I always defend him because at least he's working. He's not working on things we want. <laughs> well, <laughs> some of it I want. But, you know, he's working on what he he wants. So it is what it is. The guy the guy gets a lot of, uh, a lot of crap. So just, just imagine the pressure he's under to deliver after the last season and a half or so of the TV show and, and the response to it. And he, the, even if that was what he wanted to do with it, he's, he has to second guess himself a little bit and see, you know, well, certainly. And, and there's a lot of pressure whenever it comes to performing and when people have an expectation, I'll be honest, uh, booktube's a lot like that. Sometimes like you have a video that does well, or like I have a great, uh, I'll never forget. Like the first time Alan came on, I mean, it was just a shift in everything that I was doing. And Alan is obviously a phenomenal person and a great person to talk to. Um, and me and him both had the conversation afterwards. We said, dude, how do we ever top that again? 
You know, I mean, you think about these, you're like, how do you top that? You know, and I think especially um, in today's age, at least in America, there is a uh, focus on always going bigger and better until something's dead. Uh, you see this with Star Wars and other franchises. A uh, bookborn was talking about this lie. last night. We did a adaptation video for World Hoppers, and she was saying, like, you know, they just they do it until it's dead. You know, it just is what it is. And, and that's kind of how. Um, how it feels whenever you have like a big hit of something or, or you had some success. But I told Alan, I said, I think anytime we talk, it'll be something to see now, whether or not it always reaches the same numbers and stuff like that's who cares. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you get to that point where it's like, I'm just having fun. So yes. let's do it. Yeah. And I wonder if George stopped having fun. I would imagine. So he, he just may want to break, you know, he just may want to have a, just want to take a nap, a long nap. <laughs> yeah. We we'll do other things for a while. The long sleep. I get it. Some days I just want to go back to bed. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh man. So what are you reading right now? I am reading uh, "The Winter Road" by Adrian Selby. Okay, I haven't heard of this, but I, I like the title. Sounds depressing. It's, it's yeah, it is. <laughs> it's pretty depressing. Well, it's not too depressing. It would. Uh, so he's written three different books, and they're they're all standalones. They can be read as standalones, but they're in the same world or the same universe. So you. They are connected, but you don't have to read them in any order. And it's really, uh, really interesting because they, they use herbs. Uh, herbs are like magic in the world. So it is a, uh, his action scenes are, or I've heard his action scenes are really good, but I'm loving his action and I'm really picky about action scenes. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I think some, some authors are good at it and then they just, it, it's almost like sometimes they show off. Like hmm. Stephen King shows off sometimes. Like you're reading Stephen King, and it's like, okay, you're just showing off because you're you're so good at what you do that you just want to like show off. Like, you know, you're uh, you know dribbling between your legs and you're bouncing the ball off of people's heads, and it's like just slam dunk it. You know, just, it sometimes good. we want to lay up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is this the first Selby book you've read? It is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, that that sounds pretty interesting to me. I've been looking for more shorter standalones yeah. um, because of obviously doing Realm of the Elderlings, Malazan, A Song of Ice Fire reread, all these things. I'm like, I need some good four to 600 page standalones. Yeah, this one is, let me see, I think it's four, uh, almost 500. So That's like, a per sweet spot. That's yeah. perfect. And we are doing a, uh, a deep dive into it with Adrian Selby uh, later this month. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join us for that. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Doing that with books with Zara and, uh, and I think one other person is going to join us for that. So. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and uh, Bald Booktuber here, Scott says, I know the uh, Brothers Gwyn are big Selby fans as well. I have his books on my radar. Yeah, the Brothers Gwyn posted a video today. Uh, oh, for, yeah, for those who don't know, um, they kind of stepped away um, due to a family crisis that happened. Um, it was an unfortunate um, you know, passing in their family. And uh, I just want to send out my best regards to the Gwyn family. I know it's been a long, uh, arduous process for them, but I love those guys and i love that family so much uh john gwen we were talking about good battle writer oh man john gwen's one of my favorites and uh just uh seeing them go through this really tough time uh is hard because they seem like such a tight-knit family like i believe in them you know it's not the uh facade of we're all together like they really love each other uh and man the brothers gwen what a great channel and i'm glad to see him back and i, I really hope the best for their family so shouts out to them uh, if they're checking this out, make sure to go support that channel. And uh, John Gwen has a book coming out in a few weeks, I believe. So mm. uh, we'll, I'll be reading that probably in May. So nice. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's amazing how supportive the community is. I've been yeah. pleasantly surprised that it's been so welcoming. And it, it, you continue to meet new people all the time that are really supportive and uh, really care about each other. So it's it's been a really good experience. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's always going to be exceptions to that. But I think largely this community is is very tight knit. Uh, and a lot of the authors are also just quality people like John Gwen is a dude I would love to grab, you know, a beer with and, and sit down and talk and he does vi Viking reenactments. And we're all nerds, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have you read any John Gwen? I've read Malice and Valor. And cool. I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> fair, well, fair enough. Did you enjoy the battle scenes at all? I did, but there was just so many of them. Well, that's uh, fair. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I can see why people like it. It, just, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't for me. So, yeah, that's fair. Uh, and, you know, also his debut work, working some things out. Yeah. Um, 
I've I've been reading some Bernard Cornwell. I'm about to wrap up his Warlord Chronicles trilogy, and it's amazing how much inspiration you can see of that in Gwen's work. Uh, Gwen definitely is a big Bernard Cornwell fan, and then I now reading Cornwell's combat. I think he's like my favorite combat writer of all time. Have you ever read him? I haven't. I have to check I, it out. I would love to hear your opinion, especially someone that you know you say that you enjoy battle scenes. Um, I think Cornwell does such a nice job of getting into the details of what is actually happening, but also still making it feel very uh, human and, and diving into the emotions of it and also the fallout, which is usually the most important part, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, who do you think writes the best combat you've read? Ooh, that's a tough question. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I am a fan of uh, Richard Nell's combat. Okay. Good job. Anthony Ryan does really good combat, too. Um. Who else? It's tough because it's tough to write good combat. Uh, Abercrombie is good at combat too. He's another one that gets a little carried away sometimes with combat, but he does write good combat scenes. Yeah, and I feel like with Abercrombie, it's on purpose because that's kind of what he does. You know, like he does a he does a stick uh, shtick until it's dead, and it's like <laughs> he's doing it on purpose. Like he's he's trying to get you to go, okay, okay, Joe. Like it's part of the charm of it. I feel. Yeah. Um, I've always enjoyed the grittiness of uh, Abercrombie's combat. Yeah, just, it does. Yeah, it's it's and he he just sprinkles in humor too. That is just mm-hmm. in the right places. But yeah, he does beat things to death. <laughs> by the, the end, <laughs> by the end of that trilogy, I was like, okay, that's enough. Let's let's uh, let's get on with it. Because <laughs> 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 the things that were really funny in, in the fir- in the blade itself that I loved, but the third book, it's like, okay, you know, he the sounds he makes when he clicks his mouth, and I know the, you know, okay, like I get it. Like, let's let's get on with it. But I, I still <laughs> love his writing. But yeah, it, it does get a little, you know. Yeah. So are you planning on reading the standalones? Have you started the standalones or? Yeah, I'm actually reading that with uh, Yulene Reads and um, Amazing Worlds. Uh, nice. We're going through each one. And I think this uh, this month is we're reading Red Country. Nice. I actually love Red Country. It's the one that probably gets the most flack, but I'm a sucker for Westerns. So it is what it is. Um, you know, I, I like Unforgiven, Tombstone, all that stuff. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So whenever I saw that Abercrombie had written a Western, I got pretty excited. So I may have been biased going into it. Um, it's a lot of people's least favorite of the standalones, but I think it's my favorite. I really enjoyed Heroes as well. Yeah, I enjoyed that more than I did. Uh, I, I wasn't crazy about uh, Best Serve Cold, but I enjoyed Heroes. Yeah, Best of Cold is like really interesting because whenever I first uh, got an Abercrombie, a lot of people were saying, you know, this is one of his best books. And I still think there's a lot of people out there that think that. But it's a lot more polarizing than uh, than any of his other stuff, in my opinion. Like, I would say, m- like, most people fall into uh, a category with all of his other books. But Best of Cold, that's a tough one. Hmm. Yeah. And maybe it's the vengeance arc, right? It's a, it's a, it's a vengeance story, um, yeah. which I'm in. I'm in, too. I like it. Um, I, would, I would be curious to see how I feel about it on a reread. I wonder knowing where it goes and what happens if I would enjoy it as much as I did the first time. Cause I, I did like that book. That was pretty good. Yeah. It, it does have almost a, when you think vengeance, like this quest for vengeance, I kind of think Westerns too. So maybe the reread you'll like, you'll enjoy it more. Cause it, that is a very Western, you know, the, yeah, uh, you know, for, out for revenge kind of thing. You came yeah. to my farm and killed my sheep and now I'm coming for you, Buster. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just the, the Western trope. I love it. Yeah, but the blade uh, uh, Abercrombie will, will always have a special place in my heart because I I didn't know books like that existed until I read the blade itself. I didn't know that that was even a thing. You know, it, it was a whole different experience. So it was a uh, it was it was really cool. I I love the blade itself. It's great. Yeah. So did that kick you down a grim dark rabbit hole then? Because I've seen. I mean, you've read a lot of grim dark. Yeah, I did definitely. I've always been a fan of the darker, broodier, uh, you know, dark and gritty kind of stories. But so that was right on my alley. But uh, yeah. And it has it mixes in the fun. It's like I kind of thought if Quentin Tarantino wrote a book, it'd be like something like The Blade itself, just the humor and the violence and everything. Yeah, over the top. Yeah. I, I I would agree with that, and and I like describing it like that because that's how I get my non book reading friends to read things. You know, you have to relate it to other forms of media. And uh, my best friend ended up reading Abercrombie because I said something to that effect, and now he's read all ten. So nice. pretty awesome for a non book reader. I mean, that's really impressive. Isn't it funny the lengths we go to explain things to our friends who don't read? Just oh, to... I'll, I'll embarrass myself in public. <laughs> <laughs> I know no shame when it comes to trying to get people to read books I love. I, have, I know no shame. But now I'm a little bit more careful because it is so stressful when someone reads one of your favorite books. Yeah. 
it's like please don't hate this i'm begging you please don't yeah. hate this yeah especially not especially non-readers because they spend so much time reading it and then they come back to you like you know three months later i really hated that book that you recommended to me and then you feel like crap so. yes i had a guy hit me up and he's like hey you're the fantasy guy what book should i read and i'm like no no and uh, I recommended him The Blade itself. And he was like updating me through the first few chapters. He's like, dude, this is like really good. He's probably around like maybe a halfway point. And I haven't heard from him since. So I'm like, I hope he just fell off the horse. Like, and he just stopped reading or it, I hope he didn't hate it. Cause I would feel so bad. And he also bought all three books at once. Hmm. And I was like, could you not? <laughs> could, could you just buy one? Just <laughs> like, it wasn't even a box set. Like you didn't even get a discount. Like you just bought all three. And now I feel very bad. If you hate these, you know, yeah, it's tough. Or when uh, someone when someone watches a review of yours, you really like a book, and they read it, and like I didn't really care for that book. <laughs> it's such a bummer, but it's really great when they love it. That's what's it's, so. It's the yeah. it's the up and down. Yeah, and, and there's honestly for me, and obviously this makes sense because this is you know our tribe, right? As as Philip Chase always calls it. Um, <laughs> but whenever you do like link up on a book. It, there's like a there's a good bond there you know and you can always go to that person and, and say references from that piece of work and it just makes it a really tight-knit um you know friendship or you know acquaintance and i think that's why this community is so tight right mm -hmm. is like to watch our content you have had to read the books yeah and that that's a buy-in that, that that's an emotional investment that's a time investment and that's why people get very passionate about their books yeah definitely <laughs> And to a fine reads how to comment about uh, about how awesome Gunmetal Gods is, and Gunmetal Gods was is probably my favorite book of the year so far. Wow! So that's funny because I saw that you had reviewed it, and I haven't read it yet, but um, I, I actually got it for Christmas from wow. from her. So uh, I have been waiting to read it, but I've heard it's really, really good, and I was going to ask you about it. So what what did you like about it so much? It it did well. It's very, <laughs> it's one of those books that I enjoy because it doesn't uh, it doesn't shy away from the horrors of battle and war and it, the the action it's the focus isn't necessarily in the action and the what happens it's what happens after so yeah you think if you're in this world and, and a keep and a, or a, a castle gets sacked or whatever what happens after you know what what happens to, to the survivors what happens to the people mm -hmm. who are wounded what are the people who come in what do they do to, with people who are just the regular you know john and jane who are just kind of wandering around living their lives what happens to them uh, so it, it does get pretty, pretty violent, uh, but I really love that about it. So I didn't shy away from it. And it is, it has a, like a Middle Eastern spin on it. It's almost like uh, Game of Thrones in the Middle East, I think is what kind of the tagline was. So I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was, it was really great. And the Conqueror's, uh, Conqueror's Blood is a lot different. The sequel is a, just a, it's a lot different. It's still good, but it's very different. So it's a trilogy? I think he's planning on it being a trilogy. There is a, a prequel novella too that we're reading. Um, but yeah, I think he's planning on a trilogy for that one. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. I, uh, I think that's one that I'd like to get to. Um, I always have a couple self pubs or like lesser known books that I like to slide in when I can. Um, and that's near the top of the list that in uh, seasons of Albedon by, uh, Ooh, Christopher Warman. Yeah. And, uh, I, I always mess up, uh, his, his wife's name, but Elon, Elon, thank you. Elon Marsh. Right? Is that right? Marsha. Yeah, because yeah, well, yeah, when I when I, uh, when I talked to them, I had to ask her how do you how do I pronounce your name? Because I didn't want to mispronounce. So she said it's like Elon. Elon. Like Elon. So it's a wonderful name. And I still managed to bungle it. So you know. Listen, <laughs> I do my berserk streams, and I, <laughs> dude, I mispronounce so many things, and then I'll pronounce it right for like ten minutes, and people are like, "Good job!" And then I mess it up again. They're like, are you messing with us? I'm like, no, I've just had a lot of a lot of head trauma. <laughs> I can't help it, man. Look at it. By the way, look at this bruise on my arm. That's gnarly. How did that happen? So I did a jujitsu. Uh, dude went to like step up to the head and try to pull off some sort of arm bar. And like his knee pinched my arm. Oh, man. And, and it's not like one of those bruises like you forget it's there. It hurts. Like it doesn't feel good. No, but it yeah. doesn't look good. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. And my legs are all, you know, I don't know. I've I've been bad to my body. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> I think some some martial artists, I think they roll, they get like a rolling pin and they roll out their shins. Is yeah, that conditioning the shin. Uh, yeah. So no. Uh, so I've done some Muay Thai, um, but I, I'm not 
<laughs> Listen, I'm not winning any kickboxing championships. You know, I, I started uh, martial art, uh, mixed martial arts late in life after pro wrestling, which beat my body to shreds. Um, no, nah, you're not going to catch me with a broomstick uh, forming scar tissue on my shins. I'm good. I'm good, dude. I, you know, I'm glad that I can throw a kick properly. That's that's great. You know, but uh, I've never gotten to that hardcore uh, thing. But it is a real thing. Conditioning your legs. You know? Yeah. I used to go to a like an MMA gym back in the day, and uh, here in Albuquerque, there's a bunch of martial artists that I and then I, I recognized people that I would work out with, and I had it's not like I worked out with them. I was just there struggling to breathe, and they were doing their thing. But <laughs> you kind of see people that you've seen in the gym that you know they're on on TV in the UFC or whatever. So yeah, it's yeah, and cool. it's awesome. My uh, my jujitsu professor just had his first MMA fight, and he beat the guy in like 30 seconds. He fought a pro boxer who was six ten, six foot. 10 inches what uh and the guy was pretty good like he was a good boxer um but my uh jujitsu <laughs> uh instructor isn't i mean he's top 10 in the world right now so he's just a monster just an absolute unit of a man um yeah and uh it was cool watching him go do his thing you know it's pretty awesome so yeah it's amazing what people can do with their with their bodies yeah I, other people. <laughs> yeah right I'm at the point now where I'm I'm good. I'm gonna read books about people doing terrible things to themselves instead of doing it to myself. Yeah. Um, Brenaj, oh. I hope I'm not mispronouncing. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, not a fantasy, but I'm reading House of Leaves right now. Have either of you read it or heard of it? You have, Steve, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. we read it in October uh, as a like a book of the month kind of thing. I loved it. It is House of Leaves is interesting because I've heard some people say it's like pretentious. They hated it. Some people love it. Everyone has a different opinion. It's very divisive, but it's all those things. It is pretentious. It is annoying. It is. I think it's brilliant at the same time. It's one of those books and you read it and while you read it, you have all these really uh, like ups and downs and sometimes you're like, why am I wasting my time with this garbage? And then you get to the end. And it's like, wow, that was awesome. Like all that made sense now that I get to the end. So hmm. it is a journey. It is, it is a journey. There's some really dry portions of it, but there's so much in that book. You can read it several times over. I'm sure find there's like hidden messages. You can decode letters. You can, there's little markings on certain pages. It's really it's crazy. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I've heard it's a really challenging read. I, I like that stuff, but I gotta be in the mood, you know? Yeah. It's one you want to take your time with. So it's one of those you could probably just jump in and out here and there just yeah. to kind of break things up but yeah it is uh it's for someone to sit down and, and compile all that together i mean the amount of time it must have taken to put all that together it's crazy but yeah it is quite it is quite an experience yeah i feel like um those the people that write those types of books have to be big fans of puzzles you yeah. know because it's essentially a big puzzle at that point yeah yeah uh, Derry has a question for you. He says, I have a question for Steve. You do so many buddy reads. How do you manage, arrange uh, your time to organize it? It's a good question. Uh, I've been doing less this year. My, that was my goal is less buddy reads and <laughs> just kind of reading random stuff. Like, I don't want to say mood reading, but kind of mood reading. Uh, so I, uh, I have, I manage the time by not having any, any other hobbies anymore. I just, I don't have, so I, I tell people. So yeah. I, I, I sacrifice my other hobbies for, for the love of books and for all you fine people, but it's fun. So, no complaint. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the cool thing about uh, this being a hobby is that, like, it, it's it is, you know, we do one thing, like we read a lot, but you get to do a lot of stuff with that experience. And whenever you finish a book, you get to, you know, articulate your thoughts uh, in front of this, and then that opens up the door to understanding, you know, how live streams work. Um, also, you get better at talking with people. You also get to learn video editing and. All these types of things. I mean, and, and you know, I, I guess in a lesser extent, it is kind of marketing, which is interesting, I think. Um, so, like, we get a lot out of this time and out of this hobby. Uh, and it can be exhausting, but I'm with you. I've pretty much cut down almost every other hobby that I find non-essential to my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a... Uh... You have a good point, though. That is, you, you do learn a lot. And you get to buy cool audio equipment, too. So Yes, reasons to buy more toys is <laughs> you know i uh, i bought this m1 mac mini i didn't need for video editing and all i do is jump cuts so 
What am I doing? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Steve, how do you get so many great interviews with authors? I was, this is actually a question I was hoping to, to get into. Um, but you are, you're someone that has interviewed a plethora of authors um, from Janie Wirtz um, and many, many others. A lot of self pubs as well, which I think is really awesome. So why do you tend to go with interviews? And also, how do you go about interviewing authors? Uh, well, I enjoy the interviews because I like to hear people's stories. I mean, we read their books and it's kind of like I, I want to know more about them and what inspired them or what went into the book or how they wrote it or what was going on in their lives. And I just like getting to know people and getting to hear their stories and their ups and downs and their failures and their successes and how they how they overcame. I mean, talking to Jenny, someone like Jenny Wirtz, I mean, that was. <laughs> She's awesome. Crazy. Yeah. Just wild. I mean, if if you don't get inspired. Yeah. listening to jenny wertz then i have to check for your pulse because she is next level uh, but i've Passion. met so many awesome people yeah i've met so many great people and uh, as far as how to get them um i just have to i just kind of put myself out there and just ask and i've i've only been told to buzz off by like two by two of them I, kind of like it's not worth my time kind of thing and i understand they're busy you know i'm not who am i you know right so but no, I've i've had pretty good luck with uh the ones i have asked i've i've been i've been surprised how how um how, the, how open they've been to come in to talk to me because they could be doing anything else. So for them to take time out of their day, they uh, to come and talk to me. I mean, you know, I, how can I complain about that? No, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. You just have to ask, and it's you know, for anyone who wants to, who anyone who has a channel or wants to do it, just just got to put yourself out there and just interact with them, and they're just they're people too. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I do. And I always say, you know, whenever you get to talk to an author, you do gain a bias, but not because you can't critique their work, but because you then actually find out their motivations for what they were writing and their intended message. I think there's still a conversation to be had about like how the execution was, like how effective it was. But it definitely gives you a different reading experience whenever you actually get to hear the author talk about their intent. I think all of the transparency that Steven Erickson has given about the Molasson series. I mean, he dumped his entire life into it. Uh, and knowing what I know about him now from the various interviews and also getting the privilege to speak to him has totally changed my outlook on Malazan. Uh, and again, it's not because it's like, well, he's, he's my friend. I can't give it a bad, right? No, not that. But I mean, you know, I already enjoyed the experience and then seeing another layer from the author's perspective. It's one of the richest things ever. I mean, I would love the opportunity to pick Robin Hobbs brain, um, George R. Martin, you know, other, my other favorites or even like, you know, talk to Brandon Sanderson, because I think that guy has a wild imagination. Yeah. It would be so interesting to see, uh, how they approach the work. I also think Sanderson's pretty transparent though. Um, mm. as much as he can, he definitely likes how he likes being the DM. Like he likes having the answers. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to the writing process, obviously he has a lot of, uh, you know, really quality thoughts when it comes to being commercially viable and, mm. and he gives those out in his lectures. Uh, but I think author interviews are amazing. But with that said, I it drives me crazy to do them <laughs> because it's just like um, it's nerve wracking in a way. Not like so much like starstruck, but I always feel uh, like I'm the dumber one of the two. You know what I mean? I'm used to that feeling, though. So I'm, <laughs> it doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it can get a little nerve wracking. And it is uh, you do put a lot of in, a lot of. Um, energy and time into it to prepare for it and to uh to pull it off it's not always easy but I, I do see them almost like a behind the scenes kind of um you know you read the book it's kind of like watching a movie and then watch then watching the behind the scenes because you get to kind of find out what happened uh during the making of the book or just about them as just their lives yeah and i will say i think part of the reason why um I'm a little nervous to do the interviews is because my other love in life was pro wrestling and I got behind the curtain and I did it right. And it takes away the magic, you know, like when you figure out how the magician does his tricks or you figure out the internal workings. And sometimes you also find out things about the people you that were your heroes and you're just like, Oh, that's depressing. Um, you know, so part of me likes having the veil there a little bit, but I am a sucker for a good author interview. Uh, I could watch interviews with my, some of my favorites, all day. I mean, I love those sit down talks with George R. R. Martin. I've watched them. <laughs> I've watched every one multiple times while playing like mountain blade on my computer. Uh, I just turn them on, do my mountain blade campaign and have a good time with it. You know, uh, how do you go about preparing for your interview? Do you do a lot of research prior? I do. Yeah. So 
usually what I do is I'll, I'll look, well, if I've, if I'm familiar with their books, I'll try and I, I try to mix things up. I try not to focus too much on, on their books and focus on them too. Cause I want them to yeah. walk away with a, like a good, like a good feeling. I don't want them to walk away. Like I just hammer them about books or just throw questions at them. So I try and make it like we're doing right now, like a back and forth. And, um, so I'll look into them. I'll, I'll look up their bio and, and a lot of the times on their bio, they'll have past experience or, you know, like, um, uh, you know, education or things, other things they've done professionally. So I'll try and get kind of engaging questions to try and get an answer and not a yes or no. Cause the last thing you, I'm sure you know this, the last thing you want is a yes or no. You want to ask questions that people can expound, it can expand on and explain mm -hmm. things. And so, um, I kind of, I get a list of questions together about a page and a half or so. And then I have a few standard questions that I ask them just for fun at the end, just to kind of, I want them all to walk away with a smile. So I try and get them to relive fun memories or something that's pleasant, not like a, you know, I, I try not to, and I try not to catch anyone. I, I don't, I don't, I don't try, I try and stay positive when mm -hmm. I can, uh, just because, you know, I don't want it to be a, like a, like a gotcha Oprah thing or anything, you know, it's you know, I don't <laughs> anybody cry. I just want to have a good time. So, so you're, you're not the, I see, I want to be the Oprah of booktube. That's so that's my, <laughs> Maybe, maybe one day. Um, yeah, you know, I always like finding uh, really random stuff about somebody and bringing it up because I know my favorite interviews when I would be interviewed for wrestling was someone that would pull out like an obscure match I had in like the backwoods of Kentucky. And I'm like, how did you know that? You know, uh, whenever I interviewed AP or a critical, I always call him AP, a critical dragon here on YouTube. Uh, he brought up uh, that he knew my very first tag team name, which is a very obscure wrestling fact that I didn't know was on the Internet. And like, you know, I'm interviewing him and he brought that. I just love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do also like kind of uh, getting getting them loosened up right with authors, yeah. because I think there's like um, a stigma that maybe they can be a little bit of square. You know, they can be squares like, you know, it's like, oh, they, they write and that's all they do. Uh, I love talking boxing with Erickson. I thought that was just such a delight. Like at the end of two and a half hours, you know, we just started talking about triple G and Canelo and everyone's like, what are these two talking about? But <laughs> that was a moment that we had. And then like when I saw him in Florida, you know, we talked more boxing. So there, it starts to build a relationship outside of books too, which can be really cool. Yeah, definitely. And and I, I also try to watch or read other interviews they've done. Cause I don't want to ask them the same things over and over again. Yeah. And I do try and find those obscure, obscure things that I can find that no one else has found yet. But sometimes it's tough to find, you know, because a lot of them are, are very private. So, yeah, for sure. And, you know, the Internet's a scary place for sure. Yeah. Sometimes I think I say too much. <laughs> yeah. Don't well, think too much because you might find something you don't like. <laughs> Chris said having Steve be my first author interview was an honor. We actually talked about uh, Seasons of Albedone earlier, Chris. Uh, I know you're joining us in this now, but we were singing its praises. So, yeah, um, yeah. I love that. It's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Chris, Chris has done a wonderful thing there and he's working on more stuff, which, which is, uh, really awesome. Love to see people going after it, going for the dreams. It's, uh, it's really encouraging. Uh, one thing in author interviews that I found out that I do not enjoy is, uh, where do you get your ideas? <laughs> it's apparently like the big no, no question. This is something I've learned. Um, I, I too also always read interviews with people if they have had them. And I try, I try to either pivot off questions or I try to avoid questions. Erickson was easy because Erickson's been interviewed hundreds of times but over two decades, right? So if anything, it was harder to find questions he hadn't been asked, but it was really fun to pivot off some old questions and see how he's changed his mind. Um, he has a very interesting take on um, coincidences. It, it, very philosophical, but I found it in a Reddit AMA. And you could tell, like, he got asked this question about coincidences and convergences, and his answer was so in depth that you're like, he liked that question, you know. Um, so that's fun. It's fun picking people's brain in a different way, for sure. Yeah, and it's uh, and, and you want to get them to to relax and to kind of just let go a little bit, and to uh, you know, just to have have a good time and and you know, to let let new people learn about their work and and that's and I get really inspired talking to all these different authors and hearing their stories and how mm -hmm. they manage because especially indie authors because there's so many you know so many things they have to do they have to they're a a one-stop shop a lot of times and for them to put so much work into something that they really a lot of them don't make a whole lot of money or if any i mean they yeah. a lot of time and, and energy and money and it's just for the love of of their stories and that's you can't you know you have to admire that
yeah, I admire anyone that takes time to hammer away at the craft and uh, try to provide entertainment and, and build something that's going to live on past their expiration date. I think that's like one of the cooler things we can have an opportunity to do as humans. Like I'm very envious of that. Um, and I've always felt like writing for some reason, writing and music seem to be the things that can really transcend generations and, and connect people back to a time that doesn't exist anymore, hmm. which is probably why I love like medieval inspired fantasy so much. Um, I, I was just talking about with my in-laws last weekend and I was like, if I could just get plopped down in Rome for just one day, like I just want to, you know, or, or, you know, during, uh, when Arthur was supposedly doing his thing, like I would just love to sit in on some of those conversations and some of those moments. Um, and through books, we get that opportunity a lot of the times. So, yeah. Um, we have another question question for you both. What are some good tactics to design interview questions for keeping things open-ended enough to pivot into playoff answers, et cetera? Is it just a matter of practice? I think it's a matter of practice and also messing up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And th there are, I'm sure, Jimmy, I'm sure you've, you've been here is that, you know, you finish up an interview and you kind of rethink things in your mind and you think, you know, you think of an answer they gave you and you're like, man, I should have, I should have pivoted. I should have, I should have asked them this from that mm -hmm. question. So it's, and you have to think a few questions ahead too, because when they're answering one question, you have to listen to what they're saying, but you also have to think, okay, well, how am I getting, going to use this answer? Or can I use this answer for another question? Yep. A lot of the times the best questions come just organically from the conversation. That's right. Um, almost everything I do it usually revolves around I pick five and then I try to either mesh the five in or I go down off a branch and then I come back. And it's just how how conversations kind of work. Uh, yeah. And it's also really great whenever you can get them to be circular around a certain theme like Erickson. I knew he wrote Malazan, but I knew bringing him on chatting with nuts. A lot of people haven't read Malazan. Yeah. So I said, let's make this about the craft of writing. And the dude basically gave us a seminar. I mean, it was phenomenal. For anyone who's who wants to be a writer, I really implore you to re or to watch that maybe twice and take notes because that guy was so transparent with his process and what he thinks is a good way of going about it. And uh, he he's he's been around the block, so mm. yeah, I've, I've reached out to Stephen Erickson, haven't heard back. <laughs> yeah, uh, he can, he can be slow to respond sometimes. I I I, uh, I emailed him after I interviewed him and I didn't hear it was right around the holidays. I didn't hear for a few days and I was like, okay, he hates me for sure, hates me, you know, and it was not obviously not the yeah. case. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say like you were you question like oh should i have asked this that's every conversation i have in my life i'm just yeah. like oh god why did i say that, that was so stupid <laughs> it's just how i am how do you prepare for these jimmy how do you for these uh chatting with nuts well, episodes? uh one i'm very selective about who i bring on uh mm -hmm. and that's not to say that people i don't bring on i don't like or anything like that but uh there are certain vibes i get from people when i see them um that tell me that hey this is someone i could talk to for two or three hours yeah. um which is cool and sometimes it, sometimes it works out really really well and sometimes it's it's a bit of a process as, as i go through um but preparing for these i like to figure out what similarities i have with someone um who has read a lot of the same things but i also enjoy finding out what we disagree on or what yeah. uh they have done that i'm very interested in like house of leaves is actually something i was going to ask you about hmm. um but i've also brought on people that i don't agree with them on much and that's fun to find a midway point one of my favorite people to talk to now is bookborn and bookborn is a massive brandon sanderson fan and she's also a very positive bubbly person she's just fantastic and uh, I always tell, say I'm a nihilist and I'm pessimistic and things, but we have very different worldviews. But I can tell you, man, uh, I love talking to Bookborn. I think we have some of the best conversations I've had in my adult life. And right. I just value her, um, you know, her input, but also her friendship quite a bit. And it's just someone that I would have never, you know, thought uh, just the way that we see things is so much different, but she, she's such, such a good person and a, and a great conversator. So I, th I think that's it. Uh, I want people that I can have uh, interesting conversations with. And also there's just certain things like when I watched yeah. your stuff, you know, I can see you carrying a conversation. Um, also, you know, you, you have the good audio equipment, which is a big plus. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I went down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of it's mood, man, especially with something like this. It's so freeform. Like I knew tonight after this, this, this house hunting sucks. Right. And I'm like, I just wanted to come in and have a super chill conversation. So I pick a guest that kind of is hopefully appropriate for my vibe. Um, nice. And then, you know, when in doubt, you just get Alan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> like whenever I don't, like don't have enough time to plan or I'm not sure who like what what I want to do, I'm just like, Alan, are you free? Or sometimes Alan hits me up and he's like, You got anybody for next week? I'm like, No, man. And then you know, he comes on and uh and that's 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 cake. great. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It's good to just go and go on like a, I don't say autopilot, but just kind of relax and just let things go. It's it's a lot less pressure to to prepare and to I guess you have to you have to be sure to kind of vet the people you invite on because you don't want someone that's gonna say something crazy either and you know it's gonna or you know yeah i mean definitely i mean i do like hot takes those are always fun i mean alan has <laughs> alan's had some hot takes i've had some other people come on um and just like trash my favorite authors i'm like oh that's sick you know so that's fun but i do know what you mean like i i do uh you know i vet people before i bring them on but the reason why this is doesn't take a lot of preparation is because i'm just being me mm -hmm. and that's it you know I'm, I'm just very i feel very fortunate that people show up and these episodes sometimes do three four five six thousand yeah. <laughs> views and it's just like crazy to me because it's just me talking shop you know i i met uh one of my patrons he lives very close to me so i went and got coffee with him and we talked for four hours wow. or some madness you know the guy, guy wanted to go home to his fiance i just kept pulling him back sit pat come back you know <laughs> and uh but we, we laugh he said yeah this is chatting with nuts i'm like yeah this is just this is just who i am this is what i do and uh and, and i like being i like being neck deep in it you know yeah. so it's it's not too hard yeah, with with author interviews, I'm sure you've you've thought of this too. Is you don't want you you know you have like questions in mind, but when you get to a certain point, you don't. Your that worst fear is I'm out of questions and they've answered everything in like one sentence each. And what it's been ten minutes. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know what it is. You take a you just turn your face about fifteen degrees and you look at the third guest, the chat, and and they bail you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what's great about live streams with, with the chat and the interaction. Uh, but when you're not on one, that's like... You know, yeah, I struggle with pre-recorded conversations, actually. Um, I was doing uh, Dudes Talking Manga, which is what I... Uh, it's a series I do here on the channel uh, about every two to three weeks. And we're doing Berserk right now. And I'm doing it with my best friend, um, who's not a booktuber. He's not a big reader. Um, but he he and I were doing pre-recorded conversations. And it was just missing something. You know, mm -hmm. it's just missing something. I said, let's try a let's try live. And he was like, oh, dude, I don't want to do it live. I don't, you know, and I eventually talked him into it and it has improved the show tenfold, in my opinion, though. I did have I did have a commenter tell me that they didn't hear, need to hear from the, uh, you know, from the crowd. They didn't want to hear all that. They said, that's just noise. I just want to hear your opinions. And I said, well, sorry, this is how we're doing it. Um, but I think the overall it's very positive. Like most people have enjoyed it more. They get involved and yeah. uh, Berserk fans are very passionate and uh, they've been they've been really good to me. So there's something about live. Yeah. That just makes me want to show up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love live audiences and I always have. Uh, it's one of the things that drew me to wrestling and the reason why I got into that. And I love this way more than turning on my camera, sitting there and doing my thing. You know, I like the conversation. I, I like when chat disagrees with me. I think it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, the that interaction is, you know, because you feel connected to the people watching and the people who are mm -hmm. and even like even if they disagree with you, it's still fun just to have that interaction, that back and forth. And they, sometimes you feel like you're talking to yourself. Yes. Like you're, they're editing and you're there talking to a camera and it's it's it can be a little. Uh, so it's nice to to uh, to have people, you know, chime in and to bail you out when you run out of questions. It's, it's pretty yeah. nice. And I, I think there's something a little bit more human about this, this environment rather than the pre-recorded videos for me. Because there is something egotistical about setting up my lights, slicking back my hair and going, I'm going to tell you why this book's off. Awesome. You know, it's like, who, who am I? You know, I'm nobody. Whereas this, I feel like is a lot more like relaxed for me. Yeah. And, and, and I have the uh, ability to change my mind on the fly, too, which is always a good thing because I'm a perpetual fence sitter. So <laughs> uh, we have another question for you. you. said, Steve, other than the Janny interview, do you have another memorable interview that surprised you? Oh wow, that's a good question. That's a tough question. You're gonna get me on that one. There's so many, so many great ones. I think the one that surprised me the most was probably, um, well, I think probably the first one I did was with Jeff Lane. He wrote One Way in the Champion Saga, and for him just to accept my my invitation and me not knowing what the hell I'm doing, you know, who am I that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that was, that was probably the one of the most memorable memorable ones because it was the first one that I did. Uh, but I remember all of them for different reasons. They all have a special, something special that I took away from them. So I, there's something, uh, there's a special memory with all of them. And I, I've i been pretty lucky that they've all been really positive. I, I've only had maybe one or two that it was hard to engage. It took a little while to engage. And then 
Mm-hmm. What I finally was able to engage was like an hour in. It's like we'll have to wrap up soon. So <laughs> <laughs> those are the best. Whenever you you wish you had more time, you know? yeah. But not not everyone's comfortable on camera. Not everyone's comfortable on stream. So Absolutely. sometimes it takes a little while for them to get comfortable and to just relax and just to just to chat like we are now because it, it it can be intimidating to do a live stream and there's people watching or you're gonna release it later or whatever. It's it's a lot. So you know sometimes it takes a while to yeah. To lose. You got to work on them a little bit, loosen them up, you know, and everyone's afraid to say something stupid, but you know, um, I say stupid stuff all the time. <laughs> all the time too, so. uh, Michael asks, Jimmy, how do I talk to my gym crush? Well, this is a wonderful question, Michael. Uh, welcome to Jimmy nuts's love line. Uh, this is like answer. I can answer this question because my wife was a, uh, girl at the gym. And basically, uh, the way that worked is I saw her squatting an absurd amount and I said, oh, my God, I'm going to marry her. And then I did. And that's it. You just got to marry him. Hmm. <laughs> no, I, how do I talk to my gym crush? Well, never interrupt the workout. Uh, never, never. You can't interrupt the pump. The pump is everything. Um, you got to catch him coming in or leaving. That's it. And uh, you got to figure out something to say. I don't know. Nice shoes. I, listen, I've been off the market for far too long. <laughs> I would, I would not survive in the age of small talk. Let me tell you something. So, what what are some some uh, what, what should he avoid doing? What's what's the what's uh what, what's going to break the gym rules? So you can't you can't do it mid workout. Don't do it mid workout. Um, okay. If they have headphones in, yeah, you're not allowed to talk. You, like you can't say, hey, take your earphones out because immediately I don't like you, right? Like I know from experience, I've had people, hey, bro, where'd you get that tank? You know, it's just like I hate you. So you can't do that. Um, Also, don't try to instruct them. I've seen guys come up to girls who are more jacked than them and say, hey, you know, in the pool down, if you uh, if you get a little bit more rotation in shoulders, like you're going to get a bigger putt. And you're just like, stop. It's embarrassing. You don't look, you know, she looks better than you. Stop. Um, What other? Um, I think that's about it. I think those are the big cardinal sins that I would avoid when trying to talk to a girl at the gym. But, Michael, it's going to be up to you. Uh, you you got to pull out your A game, man. Do you have any advice, Steve? Uh, well, it sounds like you have to catch them either coming in or leaving. So you might want to find out when they're going to be there. Um, hmm, that is a tough one because I, I don't know all the gym all the gym rules. So yeah, and you don't want to like do that repeatedly because it'll kind of look stalkerish, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's a tough one. Um, hmm, that is a tough one. So if she's wearing headphones, you're kind of screwed because you can't do that. So you have to almost catch her when she's coming in or leaving. Yeah, and you're gonna fail a lot too, you know. Um, I it, you know, you only need one. So like, luckily, I got you know, my wife loves me, and and we met, and that's great. But there's plenty of times where I struck out, and just gotta keep on moving along, you know. They say no, you say, okie dokie. Well, <laughs> just I guess the, the bad part is if if she says no, then you have to almost then you have that awkward. Now you switch gyms. Yeah. Then you gotta switch gyms. It's rough. So do you have to switch if she says no? Oh yeah, for sure, dude. You can do not come back. There's no way. So how much do you like your gym is another question that you have to answer. <laughs> is it worth the chance of changing gyms? That's what you have to decide. Is it worth Is it worth the risk? It's a, it's a big one for me. Uh, Lost in Discovery says best live content on BookTube right here. Christian, I love you. I love you, friend. Good to see you, man. Um, he just did a stream on Stormlight 5 Prologue, which apparently is nuts. I haven't read it yet, but I've heard it's pretty nuts. Nice. People are... Uh, I disagree with Jimmy's hairdo. I'm catching up on the chat and just seeing how everyone is <laughs> disagreeing with me. I think part of the ma- uh, your magic, Steve, is your voice. It's hypnotic. You draw out some really natural conversation. It's a gift. Yeah, you do. You got you got a good voice, man. Hmm. Well, thank you. Not everyone agrees, but thank you. Yeah. Well, not yeah. not everybody likes Lord of the Rings movies, and they're wrong too. So that's, that's very true. Yeah. Matthew pretty- says, is this going to be posted after? Yep. All the, every single uh, live show, unless it goes disastrously wrong, which has never happened, uh, is posted after. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, Bald Booktuber says, Jimmy not writing self-help books about marrying his gym crush is a huge missed opportunity. Maybe I'll go self-pub. There you go. Can help me get a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... Th- th- see, no, this is where I would get in, in trouble. Matthew, I'll keep you put. Michael, in two weeks, I need a report, okay? Yeah, I need to know... Us- yeah, I need to know if you're at a new gym or not. This is very important. <laughs> you want to look up gyms in the area just in case, just before, yeah. just to gauge the, you know, to gauge the fallout. So yeah. You want to see in the area. Yeah, you're gonna have to hit Yelp. You need to see what's within a five mile radius because you don't want to have a long commute. You're gonna lose focus. It's not good. 
Uh, and also you need your post-workout nutrition immediately. You know, you only got an hour and a half window for anabolic gain. <laughs> Is, is, there a, is there a radius that he has to stay out of? Is there is there like a, a like a radius he has to stay out of the certain radius, or is it just the gym? Because no, just the gym, just the gym. Oh. I I think I don't. I mean, it depends on how disaster it goes. You know, if he like walks over and spills his pre workout all over, I mean, then yeah, he has to move uh, his house. He has to, he has to, he has to get you know. <laughs> so I love this show, man. <laughs> Oh my God. So how did you end up on this crazy platform, man? Like what made you get in front of the camera? I ask myself that every day, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, um, so I, I, I used to read a lot of comic books and I was a big movie guy and I wanted to uh, start reading uh, novels and going into fantasy and horror and everything else. So I, uh, I was, uh, my family, we were all buying Kindles for Christmas and we started looking up Kindle reviews on YouTube. Like, you know, everything's on YouTube. And I found Mike's book reviews, and I didn't know this even existed. I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't yep. know people got on here and talked about books. And I was like, well, that's that's pretty neat. It's like a, and it wasn't, you know, because I always imagine YouTubers like this big, this big, loud, obnoxious personality that you have to have that to have mm -hmm. success. And I thought, well, this this person, you know, Mike is he's really calm. He's just you know normal guy just talking to a camera, and that's like, well, it's pretty it's pretty fun. And I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. Why not? Yeah. So, I have a, a mountain bike channel that I don't give much attention to. So I thought this was a, this is a good alternative. And, and then I met so many great people that uh, here I am. Yeah. It's the community and the collabs that I think keep people in uh, and also the viewers. Um, it, it's, it's always fun to see who's going to pop up on whose channel. Like you never know who's talking and, and seeing them all end up collaborating is pretty cool. It's so funny because when I was buying a Kindle, I also saw, Mike's books reviews Kendall review and I was like oh okay and, and like he did a great job about like going over all the things he cared but you can tell he's a, he's a reader right yeah. uh, and I think he was talking about his eyesight and that was something that I that's something I still struggle with uh, is that my eyes are getting worse and worse and worse um, but I didn't know that he reviewed books at the time so I I found booktube through Daniel Green hmm. and that's and then, and then you know obviously I, I found Mike's channel too and it's very different types of content creation um back then it wasn't as big of a gap as it is now. I don't think not. And that's not me slamming either. You know, that is different, right? Like they approach the content differently. Um, and I just remember being like, I feel like I could do this. And, uh, I, and I, I was kind of bored. Like I didn't have a lot going on. I had finally got, I, I'd been trying to teach myself how to code and it took up oh. like all my time for like seven months. And once I got the job, you know, I was coding during my, my nine to five. So it was like, okay, well, what do I do with all this free time at night since I'm not learning the skill anymore? And I had already been reading and I was like, you know, I need someone to talk to. Like I need, I need someone to talk about these books and it just all kind of fell in place, you know, and I've always been a creator. Like I like creating things, uh, yeah. even though I don't think I'm a very uh, creative person per se, like my imagination isn't great. Uh, but when it comes to presenting things, I, I enjoy doing that. Like I looked forward to presentations in high school hmm. and things like that. Um, but it, it is, uh, it is interesting when you start thinking back and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where did it go wrong? Yeah. It, you do. We do wonder that. And it's, uh, but I, I, I kind of felt like I was missing out. Like it looked like a lot of fun with all the interaction and all the, all the fun people I started to meet. So I wanted to be, I wanted to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's, that's a good way to put it. I wanted to be part of it, something and, and, and where do you find friends as an adult? You know, it, it's, it's really tough. Yeah, if you yeah, don't find friends at the gym, because then you have to change gyms. Work yes, out. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Darren, thank you so much for the, the uh, 10 spot and then the follow up five spot. I really appreciate it, man. It's very generous of you. It says love Steve's channel. He started Prince of Nothing, and I'm so excited to see his thoughts on the series. I, I'd seen that. And this is uh, I, you know, you talk about Grimdark. I mean, it mm -hmm. is like kind of the, in my opinion, like the magnum opus of Grimdark in a lot of ways um, for a lot of people and Prince of Nothing slaps have you read the whole trilogy or just the first book just the first one I'm, I'm, i want to get to the second one i have to get through a few things first this is the the trouble with buddy reads and things like that yes. while i love them it's like when i find a, a really great series that i want to read back to back I, I have to put things on on hold but i loved i love the first book what do you think about it Oh, I think that it's some of the most amazing fantasy ever written. That is unfortunately not for everyone. And I respect that. Um, I also think that he is proposing a pretty interesting premise behind the series. The fact that uh, there is no agency in free will. 
uh, and that not so much from a deity standpoint, really, but more of a biological standpoint that you're always destined to make the same decisions. And what happens when someone can tap into that and see basically the reasoning behind your decisions and then manipulate you? I just think all of these things. I mean, it's heavy philosophy. Uh, it's not an easy read, but it's also great fantasy. Like he has an amazing glossary uh, in, in the index of the book. It, it's just like there's a lot of really cool world building in there, too. So on top of the philosophy, which I enjoy, uh, beautiful, beautiful prose. He built something that felt like he went for it. It wasn't like he did a couple, two, three things and he didn't give everybody the answers up front. I, I just I really like that series. I, and I understand that there's things about it. that are going to make people never want to read it. But for mm -hmm. me, it's been a really profound experience and pretty formative for how I read books. Um, reading that in Malazan um, really changed me as a reader. And it's also interesting because they're polar opposites in their, in their uh, message, in my opinion. Okay. Um, um, they get compared a lot, but they are very different when it comes to the intent uh, behind the work, I think, which I think both are valid. I think it's an interesting conversation piece. So Yeah, definitely. It, it, you're right. It is, it is not for everyone. There's... No. It can be really difficult to read, <laughs> read sometimes, but yeah, I, I just fell in love with it. it was, it's so great. I flew through that one. Yeah, I, I, I got through that trilogy pretty quickly, and uh, I'm excited to read his other series. I've heard it gets a lot darker, so we'll see how, how I handle it, because there were times in Prince of Nothing where I was like, man, I don't know. <laughs> like, what am I reading? You know? <laughs> uh, uh, Brent says, Brent, what's up, man? He said, has Steve read Sun Eater? And if not, why is he not reading it right now? This is a good question because it's fantastic. I have not read that yet. It's on the list. It's on the list, Brent. I'll get to it. I promise. One of these days. I, it's I, tough. It's tough. You want to talk about something that is reads fast. Sun Eater reads fast while still being very high quality, in my opinion. I just finished the fourth book and I thought it was really good. Um, mm -hmm. But man, books two and three are some of the best books I've read this year. I just absolutely love them, you know, and I'm not, I, I like sci-fi, but like, I don't read it nearly as much as I read fantasy, um, which that might change over time uh, as I run out of fantasy, but man, this is like a good mashup, you know, um, of, of sci fantasy. And uh, I feel comfortable saying that cause Rocky also like describes it that way. So it's not me. It's just me throwing a label out there, but yeah, really, really, really good. Um, I think, I think you would enjoy it. Um, and it's interesting because like Sun Eater is really popular on book two, but it's still not hitting like that upper echelon outside of our little corner of the Internet. Uh, okay. So I'm excited to see what happens when it starts making waves uh, in, in the more general population, because I think it has the potential to be very, very, very successful. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check. It's on the list. I keep seeing those books everywhere. So there's just so many. There's just so many. Yeah, there really is. Uh Eric says he just started uh, Prince of Nothing. Baker seems uh, like Erickson and Wolf's love child, but dude, cut out the um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I also really enjoy the beginning of uh, the darkness that comes before that om um, like omnipresent narration. And a lot of people go, "Oh, is the whole book like this?" And I have to tell them no, because some people can't stand that perspective, like that all-knowing being like speaking down, which to me. I actually like it the most. It's my favorite perspective is omniscient third person. Uh, and I'm reading grace of Kings by Ken Liu right now. And yeah. Oh, I can't wait to review that book. I'm not going to say much, but like all I can say is in this culture of like picking up a book, reading it and moving to the next grace of Kings slowed me down in the best way possible where it was like, Oh, I'm just going to like enjoy this right now. Like, I don't even necessarily need to know everything that's coming next. Like I just am living in this book, in this world. And it's told from that third person omniscient. And it's just, uh, it's so good. It reminds me a lot of the way Bernard Cornwell writes because he writes from a very high perspective. And then he jumps in at the important parts and you see all this crazy stuff. And then you get some interpersonal stuff and then you jump like seven months. And that's how grace of Kings has been so far. And it is so good. Oh, nice. Um, you know this as well as I do. Everyone says everything's Game of Thrones, right? Like we even talk God, Middle Gods, Game of Thrones, Middle Eastern. Like it, it, it is, it's the default, right? Yeah. And it's tough because the Song of Ice and Fire is, is a big series and it has a lot of strengths. So it's like, okay, in what way is this like a Song of Ice and Fire? If you're comparing it, Grace of Kings, without a doubt, is the closest thing I have felt to the richness of Westeros in the lineage and the history that he has, which is one of my favorite pieces of a song of ice and fire. 
I feel like Ken Liu is doing that in the Daniel Lyon dynasty. And to see someone doing it to that level is just like, oh my God, there's still hope that I can find new favorites. You know, you know what I mean? Like, cause yeah. you read so many things you're like, am I ever going to find something that, that sparks that joy again? You know? And you always wonder and grace of Kings has done that. I'm gushing about this. I need to stop. Cause I'm not going to have anything to say in the review, uh, <laughs> but man, Bookborn recommended that to me along with many other people, Chris bookish cauldron. A lot of people did. And uh, I can't thank them enough because it is just fabulous. And it's, it's a relatively unknown series, um, which is <sighs> crazy to me. And I think it's a third person omniscient. I think people struggle with it. Hmm. Do you like, yeah. do you like third person omniscient? I don't mind it. I don't, I don't mind it at all. I did. I did like the beginning of uh, Prince of nothing or uh, the first book. I did like that a lot. I was kind of sad when it went away from it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. For me, for me, I, I don't know why, but it's always been my favorite. Uh, Side King does it in Eyes of the Dragon very well. Uh, it's actually like that book's like decent, but I felt like the reason why I really ended up enjoying it was because of the way he flexed that perspective. Um, I, he just did such a fabulous job. Hmm. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Leslie. What's up? She started Sunny to May. It's a good, perfect time for you to jump into another read along, Steve. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, 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 up, I wanted to clear the schedule and then you know we, we have conversations like this and then it's like i want to read that and i don't want to read this and then here i am so yeah there's so yeah. many things i want to get to man uh brent says aspect emperor is wild there are things in there that make prince of nothing seem like a cozy novel and that scares me <laughs> yeah. uh but i'm re i read berserk so nothing can be worse than that i, I think um hmm. Uh, B uh, Bitha Lynn says, if, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I apologize. Yeah, some books you just want to live with, uh, live in for a while. Like you find yourself reading it very fast because you love it, but you want to slow down because you want to stay there longer. Yes. And I think the world of, of Dandelion Dynasty is so awesome. I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now. Of for, I think it's Dara. Um, but dude, they have like metal detectors. You know, it's like ancient China kind of theme. Like it's not one for one, right? But like they have like metal detectors, which I think is just bizarre. And they have like hot air balloons, like aircrafts and firework uh, like type bows for anti-aircraft. It's just like crazy stuff, but it still feels like old. I, I don't know. It's so cool. I really, really like it. <laughs> uh, and Lucas says, I'm still waiting for a world that feels as real as Westeros. Sounds like I need to check that out. Yes, I highly suggest that. Um, if you enjoy a lot of the times where George goes down a rabbit hole and explains to you like the lineage of the Riverlands and all the petty people, like it's it's that it's very much that more so. <laughs> so I can see some people not meshing with it. Um, but the fact that it has like a three point six or something on Goodreads is why I don't pay attention to Goodreads reviews, because yeah. let's be honest, a three point six isn't bad, but and maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to hear your opinion on this. When you go into Goodreads. And you see a book that you like someone told you about and you want to read it and you see it has a 3.5 average. Do you not just go, hey, I'll get to it later? No, it depends on who recommended it. Like Yulene okay. reads, she, whenever she tells me there's books that she's reviewed that she really likes and I'll say, Yulene, will I like this? And she'll tell me yes or no. And then I'll say, okay, because she knows my reading taste. But usually I'll, I'll go check Goodreads and then I'll, I'll go to the one star reviews and I'll hmm. read the one star reviews. And if people say, this is too violent, it's, it's too dark, like, okay. <laughs> Steve's like, sign me up. I'm there. Like, okay. Amazon cart. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> Take me to your darkest depths. Yeah. <laughs> Try your best. What about you? What do you, what do you look for? Do you, does that bother you when the ratings well, are so, well, you're hundred percent right that there are people who make personal recommendations to me that I know, know me. Um, Patrick would be one of those people. And also uh, actually the ball booktuber, Scott, me and him have ridiculously similar taste. Um, but uh, Chris Bookish Cauldron has been one of my favorite people ever to get recommendations from. We don't read all the same books, but when he recommends me a book like Robin Hobb, who's my possibly second favorite author of all time, like I, I listen to that. But if it's something like someone drops a comment or like you, you hear something about, it, you know, oh, that kind of sounds interesting. And then you go check it out and it has like a three and a half on Goodreads. It, it, I don't want it to affect me, but I'm just like, oh, I was going to try to fit that in this month. Maybe I'll just wait the next year. Like, that's what I'm talking about. It's like I'm never going to read it, but it, it just gets harder and harder to uh, push up my TBR. Chris Bookish Cauldron, Bookborn, all these people were telling me Grace of Kings, dude, like this is your book. And I kept sliding it down. I just kept sliding and sliding and sliding it down. So then I get uh, to making my top eight or whatever it was books for 2022. And I said, I'm going to read the Dandelion Dynasty. The last book's coming out. Uh, Bookborn was very insistent that I should read it. And uh, I, I kind of want to try something different. You know, uh, we, we everyone talks about the same stuff all the time, which is cool. 
But like, I'm like, what are out there that are big series that are different? And I said, Sun Eater in the Dandelion Dynasty. Uh, now, Sun Eater is getting popular on book two, but that doesn't mean much, right? It's our corner. <laughs> so I, I it's in the bigger realm of, uh, you know, book readers, it's it's not like it's uh, oversaturated. So I was like, okay, Sun Eater will be cool in Dandelion Dynasty. Um, and I'm just so, I'm so done looking at three and a half stars and being like, eh, that's not, eh, we'll get to it. Like, I'm just done. I'm not looking at it anymore, Steve. I'm out. <laughs> Goodreads is, is subconsciously influencing me to just read Sarah J. Mass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> uh, Brent says uh, Baker is a good example of this. The average for aspect emperor is really low, but everyone I read along loved it. And that is a simple case, right? Is that, some books aren't for everyone like some books uh are going to miss with the majority of readers but if it's your niche which grimdark you know i think we both enjoy it uh, a lot we're probably gonna like it a lot so and yeah. that's cool so i do have a question for you i think that a lot of i'm, I'm sure you know this is coming but i have to ask because it's been a, a topic recently what is your definition of grimdark because everyone has a different definition so it's hard to it's hard to even know because some people don't even think it's a real thing so well so so it's interesting you say it because I just literally just did a discussion with Bookborn about uh, is Grimdark more realistic? Because that's a reason why a lot of people say I like Grimdark because it's more realistic. Mm -hmm. So my stance on it is it doesn't actually matter, but sometimes it's fun to think about it. And I know that the origins come from Warhammer 4K, uh, 40K uh, in one of the settings in there. I don't know a lot about Warhammer, to be honest with you, but I know that that's where it comes from. But then I look a lot about like the anti-hero stuff uh you know, I think Philip Chase mentioned the fact that like Thomas Covenant is not a grimdark story, but an anti-hero story more so because um, the world itself is not all that bleak. It's just one person making kind of rough decisions. Right. But I think those things probably had a hand uh, in the forming of the idea of that making a world that is not full of hope and green settings and and mystical skies and all that stuff. So the reason or I guess what grimdark is to me uh, is the fact that at the end of the work. Or while you're in the work, hope is not guaranteed. Optimistic feelings are not guaranteed, and there will be consequences. And I say this, I say this meaning good grimdark because there's bad grimdark out there. Yeah. Um, it is. I don't think grimdark is intended to gross you out or to shock you or to make you go, oh, I, I, this, I'm aghast. I can't believe this has happened. I don't think it's meant for that. Uh, can it happen? Sure, but that happens in non grimdark novels too. I think what it's meant to do is look at a darker side of humanity uh, and the, the human mind. And that is something that I've always been interested in. It's why I enjoy learning about uh, like true crime documentaries, looking into people like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, the people who will keep me up at night because I can't believe that those people exist in the same realm as me, that they that they live the same on the same streets as me. Uh, I've always been fascinated with what it takes to get someone to that point or were they born this way? You know, it, it's. There's a lot to it, and I think that's the answer, but it's dark. Um, but I do not believe that Grim Dark is devoid of hope. Um, I think that that is something that people have pushed, and I don't believe that because uh, this is an unpopular opinion. I think Realm of the Elderlings is Grim Dark, and I think that there is a lot of hope to be had in Realm of the Elderlings along with the pain. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I just think I think it's about consequences. And while it is realistic, I don't necessarily think that that is exclusive to Grim Dark. I think fantasy as a whole can have realistic elements to it. Grimdark just happens to look at the more realistic elements that might derail. A, so, well, I can't, I can't kill this character because of this, or I can't have this happen because they're main character. Everybody well, Grimdark, that might not matter. Yeah, I agree with you. I think a lot of people, a lot of people think that Grimdark means that it's absent of, you know, there's an absence of hope, but I don't, I don't agree with that at all either. There's even a lot of the, um, like the Ash and Sand trilogy. I think it's, I mean, it starts out really dark with uh, Kings of Paradise. I'm not sure if, if you've read that one yet, but uh, it uh, there was some really great moments with hope and inspiration that are inspiring and hopeful. And, you know, so there's, it can be both. It doesn't have to be hopeless, but um, it, it's interesting how everyone has their own opinion on what Grimdark is, or even if it's a thing. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there is a lot of hope to be seen whenever people are struggling on. And that's what Berserk's all about. Berserk is the darkest thing I've ever read, like not even close. Um, and... I've been very insistent on telling people because people read it for different reasons. Um, 
Berserk is not something, and there's a lot of tough stuff to talk about in Berserk, and I never recommend it to anyone. Me and Christopher Rocchio talked about this, and you could just tell we were both struggling to talk about it uh, because it's such a deep and uh, devastating series. But I am not interested in the oohs and ahs of Grimdark or, or any of the works. I don't want to, I don't like when someone is trying to gross me out. Kind of like you talked with combat earlier, like they're trying to do the most and show off. I don't necessarily need the biggest, darkest twist of all time. Um, I need to feel it on an emotional and also uh, a logical level. Like, does this make sense for this to happen? Uh, why did this happen to this character? What happens to this character after this event? Um, I think that those are the more important things that Grimdart examines. And I like that. Consequences is what comes to my mind. Right. Yeah. Consequences is a good way to describe it because there are consequences. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, when, when things are too, um, when, when fantasy gets into the whole, and sometimes it's, you know, there's some comfort reads that we, you know, we enjoy because it's, 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 they're, they're easy and you're, you're, you know, no one's really going to die. And yes, the hero's going to the hero's gonna be fine at the end and nothing really is going to, you know, it's, that's fine. But, I do like the stories that surprise you and everyone dies. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, there is something to be said whenever there's no plot armor. I mean, it can feel really, really intense. Like I engage a lot more at the text and paying attention to every single uh, detail of that. Um, now, with that said, all this can be done poorly. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I think that there's bad grimdark out there. And I, I, I think people point to that stuff to say, oh, Grimdark is this. And it's like, well, you don't look at the worst of heroic fantasy and say that heroic fantasy is garbage, do you? No, there's amazing heroic fantasy out there. Um, and and that's that's just that's just reading, right? Like, there's good and bad of everything. Yeah. Uh-oh, there you go. Uh, what makes Realm of the Elderlings Grimdark? Can you explain? What yes, I can. Uh, uh, terrible things happen to people all the time, and uh, the main characters, uh, not just Fitz, but... A lot of the characters makes decisions that absolutely drive you insane, but not for the. I don't think it's to serve to the plot where it's like, okay, I'm going to make them make this terrible decision because it's going to be so twisty and turny. It's just very, very human. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of it goes into the whole idea that things don't get better. Uh, and that, a lot of times bad decisions compound and we continue to go down a hole. And even if you end up, stopping yourself going down this avalanche and you take a left or right turn you can't you still have to fight back to get all the way to the top so you still have to go through all of those very difficult decisions that you've made with someone and i think in realm of the elderlings relationships are at the core and the characters come first and a lot of the stuff that people mess up will matter all the way to the end hmm. words spoken in the first trilogy will matter in the last trilogy and it's really hard to think like this, but that is how it is in life. Uh, you can have a big blow up with your best friend and that will, even if you get over it, even if you forgive, you can never take that moment back. And Robin Hobb never lets anything go. Uh, she explores every single consequence and nuance to that. And even um, anxiety from that character's perspective. And that's why I think, uh, I think Realm of the Elements is actually grimdark to be honest. But again, I'm coming at this, that there can still be happy moments and hope and growth uh, and some sort of optimism towards the end of it. I don't believe that Grimdark is exclusively something that has to be uh, uh, like a Prince of Nothing type thing where there's no agency for anyone and everyone has to die. You know, I don't believe in that. So I guess it depends on your uh, definition of Grimdark, which is very vast. So. That's, what's, that's what's tough, yeah. Uh, Malazan isn't Grimdark because Steven Erickson rejects that uh, completely. He's so just yeah, so I'm I'm curious about that because I I finished Dead House, Gate, Dead House Gates this week. Mm -hmm. and it is very dark, very dark, <laughs> very bleak moments in it. And while I was reading it, I thought, how is this not grim dark? Well, I think part of it's read and find out, right? Um, but I think that uh, it, it, again, it kind of depends on. Hmm, it's hard. It's hard because I think that there's an, a message behind Malazan that takes a little bit of time to get into. But once you get into it and you see these events for what they are, I don't think the intent is to make you wallow uh, in some of these things. Now, that doesn't mean that he shies away from exploring it. Um, there's some quotes I could pull up that are absolutely heart-wrenching and, and they destroy you. But let's think about this for a second, Steve. So if we look at the history of humanity right now, 
that we have on the historical record. Uh, there's some tragic stuff oh. that's happened. Yeah. You want to, de- you want to be depressed. Look at history. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. And honestly, that's what Erickson pulls a lot from history. Uh, specifically, there's an event later in the series that makes some people put it down that he took directly from North American history. And a lot of people don't know it. Um, hmm. And my question would be, do you think that human history and where we are now is a tale of prog- uh, progress and hope and of advancements? And th- I'm not saying we have it all right. I mean, we're still uh, we're, we're learning as human beings constantly. But would you not say that there has been an optimistic trajectory in a lot of ways? Now, that depends on the person. But yeah. would you classify human history as grimdark? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. Because when you're reading Malazan, you're reading Malazan Book of the Fallen. It is being uh, narrated to you as a history. And there is a certain bias around events because there is a narrator. You see what I'm saying? And because of that, and whoever's narrating this book and whoever, you know, this Book of the Fallen that we're getting recanted to us, they have picked out selective events in history that are important. So it it's just interesting, right? I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I do think it's interesting that because like you mentioned, I, I guess I, I've avoided the interviews of Steven Erickson because I don't want, I, I was afraid to be spoiled on anything. He does do that sometimes. <laughs> I, I, I've been steering clear, but I, I do think it's interesting. And I wanted to ask you about this is if the authors, wh- whether it's Steven Erickson or, or anyone else, the, any author, any creator could create something. If, if I, if I make a, a movie and say it's not a horror movie, but everyone thinks it's a horror movie, is it up to me to tell you that it's not a horror movie or is it up to the, person absorbing the material to decide that well uh i think that specifically when it comes to erickson and i would never speak for him but i imagine he has a certain idea of what grimdark is Mm -hmm. and what the message behind his work now is getting put next to um for instance you know like a prince of nothing i think that there are very fundamental like people compare them a lot but they're actually fundamentally different in what they're saying uh very, very different. Um, in fact, I think that Melazin is a story about empowerment in a lot of ways. And obviously everyone knows about compassion and empathy. We all know that everyone talks about it, but I think that there's a lot of empowerment in Melazin from the smaller people, uh, and people with very small voices who make a lot of big sacrifices. And there's a heroic journey in there too, that, that you'll see as you go. And I think it's beautiful. Um, so I imagine the problem from the author standpoint, not just even anybody is that, then getting slotted into something that people think is grimdark. I guess it, it's dependent on the author's own definition of grimdark in a way. But I believe in the author's intent and what they were doing. You could argue about the execution, right? But I believe if they say that their work is not this, then it's true. But that's also hard to say because Terry Kudgine said he didn't write fantasy. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, It's tough. I forget which author I was, was talking to recently. Or, or I've talked to a couple of them and mentioned to me that once... Once you create it and once you put it out there, it's not yours anymore. It's whoever's reading it. So it's up to whoever else to decide whether they'd like it, they hate it, they thought it was okay. Or so it's it's up to the person absorbing the material. And, and not to say that it is uh, grimdark, but yeah, just an interesting question. But who who gets to decide how to classify things? Yeah, and uh, I guess that's the end of the day. Art is all subjective, right? To the person. Yeah. Um, I find hope in a lot of things that I find like people are like, "You're insane." Um, I actually was having this conversation about a, I, I can't really say anything cause it'll spoil things, but I was talking about a series today with a group of people and they felt as if the end of said series was a little too bleak and, uh, that there wasn't as, um, uh, there wasn't this, what's the word I'm looking for? Not resurgence, but you know, they kind of repairing of a relationship between two characters. And I said, Oh, I thought that that was just beautiful because you, sometimes you can't repair things. Um, and I am one of these people that relates to relate what I'm reading to my life. I'm it's weird because I'm an escapist reader, but the books that stick with me the most, man, are the ones that speak to me. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. What other book gave you a hangover after you read it? <laughs> Malazan. <laughs> because I know that there's nothing else like it. Uh, I can go try to find other books that remind me of, uh, you know, Abercrombie, right? I can try. Now, I'm not saying that I'll ever find that, but there are things in the same vein of that. Uh, Whereas the approach to narrative structure in Malazan is so unique to fantasy, not not actually outside. It's pretty common. Uh, But in fantasy, it's it's very unique. I also feel that way a lot of times whenever I read A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, But it's it's tough because, again, there's pieces that you can find in other 
other things. And I've only read one book by this author, but another person that I think I'd be very sad if I finished all their books is Terry Pratchett. Hmm. Like he's just so witty and, and I find him to be very humorous, but I also like, there's obviously more going on there and I need to read more of him. I've only read one book, but I got the immediate feeling like, Oh no, when I'm out of Terry Pratchett books one day, I'm going to be very sad. Hmm. So, so, so for someone starting Malazan, like I am, or, you know, two books in what advice would you give them? Uh, well, uh, also, uh, Brandy with a 20 spot. Thank you. Uh, I think this Steve guy is pretty cute. Great conversation guys. A strange lady. <laughs> Brandy. Thank you so much. It's very generous of you. Yeah, um, she's watching from a couple rooms over. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, so I think the advice that I give to someone for Malazan, uh, is that it's okay if it's not for you. Uh, first off, I feel like there's a lot of people who feel like this necessity that if they don't understand, they'd have to go through Malazan because they have to prove the fact that they can understand it and get it. Uh, it is confusing. Uh, there are things that don't make sense. I have finished all 10 books and there's still some things I don't understand. My advice to Malazan is I invite everyone to engage with the books. This is not a series that I think is just best to, I read one, I leave for six months, I come back, I read another. I've heard some people say that they like it that way. So it's going to be different for everyone. But for me personally, I think you have to kind of like stick into it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and <laughs> Malazan is unapologetically Malazan, right? Yeah. So it, I, see, I see this happen to a lot of people. So in book four, in my opinion, it kind of hits a stride point uh, from kind of like a rhythm standpoint. Each book it doesn't feel the same, but like it kind of follows the same structure, right? Um. And then people get into book eight, nine, and 10, and they say, well, I thought it was going to all like start being more like traditional like, fantasy. Like, where's the go home? You know, and it's like, no, you're reading 10 individual tales of my lives and book of the fallen. And you have to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I always tell people just to kind of enjoy it. Um, also know that it's okay if you don't like it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people can't stand these books. Um, yeah. I happen to love them. Um so th I think that's the biggest thing. And also always be questioning uh, your own views about what's happening in the book, because that is the most rewarding thing for me is that uh, Erickson flexes perspective to the greatest of its abilities. And all my favorite authors do this. Robin Hobb is phenomenal at the first person perspective, but Erickson manipulates information through perspective, through opinions, uh, even what is the right decision history of events that you read in gardens of the moon will be tossed around and retold. And then you have to figure out who to believe. Hmm. It's a really rich experience. There's nothing quite like it. Um, it's one of my favorite series of all time. So I, I think that's it is like engaging with the text in, in a way that maybe you haven't done uh, with anything else. Cause there's nothing else quite like it. So, and it's also okay if you don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm enjoying it. I'm just confused. <laughs> no, yeah, I get it. Um, I, I'll be honest. I felt less confused after uh, book four, which is weird because a lot of people hate book four, and I actually love book four. I think book four's ending is probably the second best in the entire series, maybe, um, for me. So that that that's kind of um, where I started to understand a little bit more. And I also think he kind of hit a stride with the structure, and Midnight Tides is, uh, is rather good. So... Mm -hmm. I think the first two were the most confusing memories of ice has some ridiculous moments in it, but it even gets a little bit more broad, but I thought four kind of brought it back in for me a little bit. Um, but some people think four is the most boring book of all time. So, it, but I like boring books. So, yeah, I, I do like that. It's unapolog unapologetically Malazan. That's if you're yeah. going to go for it, then go for it. Just do your thing. Yeah. And if you listen to Erickson talk, there is absolutely no way he would ever compromise his artistic view. Yeah. At, all um he even said his editor got tired of talking to him because <laughs> because basically uh they'd be like why do you have this and he's like oh well that's gonna pay off in book nine and and they're just like okay fine he's like i can't take it out it's for book nine and, and they're just like whatever steve <laughs> you know they, you you start to get on your editor's nerve when you do a lot of that right so <laughs> yeah yeah well i wonder if, if a book like malazan would be published today like gardens of the moon uh pub kind of thing self pub thing i think um you know the mm, people get really testy when you say these things but the reading level in america is around uh fifth to sixth grade level um and books are generally getting more accessible which isn't a bad thing it, it is what it is i do not think i think it would have a really hard time getting published now but with that said um i could be wrong because malazan in my opinion is really great literature 
And there's still publishers out there that want good literature. I think that um, in a lot of ways, I think that Dandelion Dynasty is something that probably goes against the grain of modern epic fantasy for today's standards. And it's uh, published by Saga Press, who also does Brian Lee Durfee's uh, uh, Forgetting Moon and The Black's Tart. Um, and I think that both of those books also kind of go against the grain a little bit. So maybe Saga Press would have picked it up. I'm not sure. But I think there are still people out there that are looking for fantasy with a little bit more to it. Hmm. Um but yeah, Malaz is not one of these ones where you can I, you could read it and just clap at the big oohs and ahs. But if if that's your kind of jam and that's cool, I don't think that uh, they're not you personally, by the way. I'm just saying this yeah, like no, in general. But if, if you're watching this, um, you know, I don't necessarily know if it's a drive by kind of thing. Uh, it, I don't think it's going to pay off for you. I don't know if the investment would be worth it to someone who just wants to, you know, kind of read and experience and move on. I, I don't think that that's the kind of thing uh, I. I there's nights where I just think about random events that happen in like book six, and I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> wow. And so, you know, we talked a little bit before about action scenes. I love Steven Erickson's action because it's not, yes. it, it focuses in on a certain moment in time, and it doesn't, it's not like a, 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 de, a description of what's happening or what like the movements are being, it's how it fits into the greater, into this whole story. So it's, it's very, it was very different, but I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's also fun because he does really good uh, like rogue close quarter rooftop combat, and then he also does the big epic battles, which you'll see in Memories of Ice. Oh my goodness. That guy can write a siege, let me tell you what. Yeah. And uh, Book 6 has a chapter that's 200-something pages long, and uh, it's probably the best chapter I've ever read. Like That chapter's better than some books I've read because it has like a rising action and climax. Like, uh, yeah, it, it's wild, dude. It's wild. The uh, the first the first scene in Gardens of the Moon that was it was it's a very epic scene but it's very short. Yes, it's very short but it's 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 very big. It stays with you and it's it wasn't didn't really take up a lot of real estate but it it keeps you thinking about it. Yeah, for a guy that wrote uh, ten very big books, <laughs> um, he he also knows how to be concise when he needs to be. And one of the things that he told me uh, when we were talking about writing because I, I I like to pick his brain because I'd like to think one day maybe I can write something that's legible. Uh, he said like when a chapter is over it's over end it i thought that was so interesting you know because some people are like oh i gotta get to this certain point in this chapter but he's like he you know he says he writes something and and he'll know when he wrote the last sentence of a chapter um and and it shows because he has some really interesting break points especially later in the series and i just think some of the uh chapters endings you can close the book and think about it for like a week. <laughs> You're like, what in the world just happened? <laughs> um, but that was something that uh, I think it's good to know whenever you've said enough. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. le less is more in a lot of cases. So, and another, and now that I'm thinking about it, the action in the Prince of Nothing is really good too because oh. it's very, it's very short. And it's, but it's, so it, it's, it's, it's more. It's like you said. It's sometimes less is more. Yeah. And, and and also let's let Prince of Nothing and Malazan do this both. And I think it's one of the reasons why they get compared. They just go for it when it comes to magic, dude. Like magic is power in these worlds. And I absolutely love that about it. Uh, especially in Prince of Nothing. Like, like there's some heinous things that happen with magic tearing people apart. Um, but also whenever he does big battles, he zooms out to that omnipresent narrator mm -hmm. and he does like the bird's eye view. And I wish more authors did that. I love it. I absolutely love the way he does that. Hmm. Yeah, it's so, it's so tough writing good. And I, I keep well, I don't know. I've never tried, but I hear it's very tough to write action scenes. So when it's mm -hmm. when it's pulled off like that, it's in. I'm, I'm sure it's even harder to write them the way that you know someone like Erickson or Baker writes them. That must be really, it's a yeah. skill. Yeah, especially when you have so many POVs and things, and you're trying to keep track of who's where. And uh, you know, geography matters a lot in Malazan because as someone who did archaeological digs. Uh, he knows lays of the land and how and he's very in tune with all of that. And a lot of it makes a lot of like actual sense, very logical. So keeping track of all that is so impressive. And I have an immense amount of respect for anyone who can write engaging combat, even just engaging combat. Cause I don't know about you do, but you ever come to combat and it's like, all right, let's go. Like, come on. I, you know, it's almost like that's, that would be the parts I would ever skim if I ever did. I don't, but if I did, it would be during an action scene. Cause sometimes you just want to see what's next. Um, this is heresy. I'll probably get yelled at in chat for this. I felt that way in Mistborn. Hmm. <clears throat> Everyone, I mean, I thought the magic system was cool, but like it would come to the fight scenes and people like, this is sick. And I'm just like, I just want to, I just want to get through this. Like, 
Like, I just want to see what happens after. Like, I don't, I don't care. I don't know why. It's just it's something about about the way it's written, which is opposite of Stormlight. Because in Stormlight, I actually think the action's rather good. Um, mm. But I like the magic system more from Mistborn. It's a strange, weird. Mm. Yeah, I think um, yeah, action stuff. Because when it's shorter, it's more it, it's more impactful for me. Mm -hmm. When it goes on for pages and pages, it's like okay, when is this over? <laughs> Yeah, I when I, I wrote a short story and I, I tried to write some combat and I immediately realized how hard it is. <laughs> it is so difficult, you know, and also not to sound cliche, right? It's tough. Uh, someone said they got to finish Wheel of Time. Yeah, I don't think balancing those two at the same time would be very fun. That'd be that, difficult. Yeah. yeah, that'd be really Have you one more time. Uh, so I read the first five books and uh, uh, I don't know if I'll ever finish it. It's not really for me. Um, I really, really like the first two books, which is funny because everyone says they get better from there. And I actually felt the opposite. I like the Tolkien derivative stuff. Uh, I'm not like, I don't know. A lot of people hate derivative things. I don't mind it at all. Like, I mean, and that's one of the reasons Sun Eater has like a lot of like on the nose inspirations from Dune, um, Hyperion, like all these things. Book of the New Sun, which I have not read yet, but I want to. And people say, you know, oh, yeah, it's all over that. And then some people will like, say that as if it's a negative which they're free to dislike it but for me not a deterrent at all so i thought jordan's best stuff is whenever he was copying Tolkien. <laughs> to be honest <laughs> have you read it i haven't uh i was it was on my radar and then yolene from yolene reed said don't bother you know you're not gonna like it she dnf'd it so i thought okay i'm not gonna bother i'll, I'll read my laws instead so here i am <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, in, in just knowing everything else you've read, I feel like Malaz is probably more up your uh, your alley. Philip Chase says, ah, the, that's heresy, Jimmy. I actually don't think so, but you wanted someone in the, the chat to yell. Oh, thank you. I see the Mistborn take. I, I thought I actually said something stupid. I usually uh, have to verify. I see that you're chatting with Philip about Malazan, which is also a great way of experience Malazan. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so glad I'm reading this with people, though, because there's so mm -hmm. many things I would be totally lost. So I'm really grateful that I convinced so many people to come and chat because um, I, after, especially Gardens of the Moon, I was really lost after that. So it's it was great to to hear so many people that I wasn't alone. First of all, and then mm -hmm. uh, the people who are, have experienced it before that you know come and kind of guide us and yeah, kind of point us in the right direction and kind of give us some perspective on it. So it's it's been really great. Yeah, I read it at the same time as Joanna, and we kind of linked up towards the end of the series, and then a bunch of people in my patron Discord. Are, are reading it currently i have uh two people i think are finishing it like probably this month or next month uh, the malazan community and, and the hob community and that in my discord is very strong uh but i think the community around the experience is definitely one of the better things um to, or the ways to better ways to read it and without philip i can say for sure i would have been a lot more confused yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> He's the best uh, person to, uh, to talk to after you finish a book because he can really set some things straight. And also, uh, Philip was the one I feel like that kind of helped me change the way I was reading them hmm. after book three, because I did books one, two and three kind of in solitary. We did a discussion for Gardens of the Moon. Don't think we did one for Memories of Ice, but then House of Chains, uh, which there were parts that at first I didn't like. But then after talking about it, you see it and you think about it, you're like, actually, that was pretty solid. And then that book gets better as you go, in my opinion. Um, hmm. Cause it has some really pivotal moments, but yeah, uh, Philip Phillips an absolute Chad, an absolute unit of a man. I love that guy. He's the nicest person. And you know, mm -hmm. someone with, you know, his intelligence and you, you would think he'd be like, you know, uh, go away, but he's like the nicest guy. It's, no. it's amazing. Yeah. He's, he's actually uh, maybe even too nice. <laughs> no, I met him, uh, met him in person in Orlando and it was an absolute joy. Um, I, I think he's a genuine guy. And yeah. in this day and age, I think someone being genuine is one of the best compliments you can give someone. It's one of the best qualities to have as a human being nowadays. So it's very true. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's wonderful. I mean, just, just a joy to, and just a joy to talk to all the time. And he comes around to talk with people like me, so he can't be too bad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He likes me. So he's good. <laughs> my barometer uh, oh yeah yeah uh joseph carroll he's an author he actually just started a booktube channel oh wonderful yeah he just started uh yesterday or the day before so he oh. also has a, a book out uh more than a vampire so okay i'll have to check it out yeah jr care okay i'll remember to check that out after and uh throw throw a sub that way oh mm -hmm. yeah 
Shelf Unstable, uh, who's one of my favorite people, just posted their first booktube video where she tier ranks Brandon Sanderson books, but she's never read a Brandon Sanderson book. Uh, right. and she's hilarious. <laughs> she's hilarious. Uh, all the Malazan co- uh, YouTube content helped me so much over the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. And to your point, Jimmy, uh, the uh, the Malazan community has been really supportive. And you would think that they'd be a little... Um, there's some fan, there's some fan bases that are a little aggressive, but I, I think I've had really great experiences with them so far with them. But you know what I mean? People who are fans of it, who are uh, really big fans of the of the series, have been really good about it. I'm sure there's 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 good about it with everything, but so far it's been pleasant. Yeah, uh, you know, I, actually, whenever I first started the series, um, I had seen some things happen um, from just random groups of Malazan fans, not not necessarily like a large portion of them that made me a little bit nervous. Um, because yeah. if I don't like something, I'm going to say it, right? Like, listen, Robin Hobbs is one of my favorite authors of all time, but the Rainwild Chronicles is not my favorites by any means. I didn't like them at all. Uh, the last two books were pretty good, but like in general, like I'm not a huge fan. I'll never read them again, right? Um, but, you know, I'm going to be honest when I said it. So like at first I was a little bit nervous. I said, well, what if I don't like certain things? And I did have critiques uh, in the first few reviews. Um, and then even later on uh, in Reaper scale. Um, but no, I had a really positive experience and I felt like it was people bringing their side and their experience to me rather than telling me I didn't get it, which is yeah. easily like folks, if you want people to not read the series that you're trying to get people to love or you want to kill a conversation, just tell them they don't get it. Easiest way to kill a conversation. It's a non-starter. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you're just not smart enough. Uh, Basically, yes. Yeah. The amount of times I've had that told to me about Matt from Wheel of Time, because it was oh he gets better. I'm like when they're like book four. I'm like I'm in five. Hate him. And they're like you just don't get it. And I'm like, well we're done here. Yeah, that's it. We can, we can, where is there, there's nowhere to go from there. I guess my brain is just so smooth that I can you know like what am I supposed to say? I, I don't know what to say to that. Um, yeah. Sorry, I guess is probably the best. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no yeah. There's that's a. You can't have a discussion like that. So no, you can't. Uh, reading Rainbow says I started reading Malazan because everyone told me that the, to read Wheel of Time, but I'm a hipster, so no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do think that uh, there is a growing popularity around that series, but I do think it's important also to recognize the fact that it is a um, uh, a niche, and it will probably remain that no matter what, even if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which it will. And I'm glad because I want Erickson to have all the success possible because he's a great guy. Um, but it's okay to not be lord of the rings or yeah. stormlight archive big i mean the good for them but like it's okay to have special things um dandelion dynasty is probably never going to blow up uh, to the size of any of these things that we're talking about and i still think at least in book one so far i think it's um, so special i think it's phenomenal so or hey our scott baker right yeah like we're never convinced in the world to read that <laughs> no and I, I i try to i'm really careful about who i recommend that to because it's not for everyone and that's right yeah so it's a tough one because while i loved it it's I, I know a lot of people who won't like it which is fine i mean we all like different things i would so. never subject someone to that unwillingly yeah you, you have know. to kind of prepare them for it a little bit yeah and there is a little bit of that in in grimdark i've seen people you know they're like you know if someone says oh i don't want to read about this heinous thing happening and people are just like oh grow up you'll grow a pair bro you know and yeah. don't do that don't do yeah. that you know, there, there's certain things in reading I don't like reading about. And I don't just mean like tropes. I mean, things that like kind of disturb me a little bit, um, uh, like violence towards children, mm-hmm. real hit or miss with me. Like, I mean, it's never a hit. <laughs> it's like, I'm, oh, I love this. But like, sometimes it can make me put a book down for a little bit, yeah. um, you know, and then it's not that I hate it or anything. It's just like, man, that's, that's really heavy. It's really, really heavy. Um, so everyone has their things that they prefer not to read about. And I respect that. Um, immensely so yeah yeah, yeah. Everyone has their own taste and, and some people just want to read romance or want to read uh yeah. traditional fantasy and good for them i mean that's you know i think the the age of agree to disagree is sometimes lost it's uh i wonder i, I miss the those uh those you know we let's we don't agree but let's be friends anyway kind of thing yeah i i think we have a lot more of that here um than a lot of other places especially on the internet and that's why uh this is uh our special little community right yeah <laughs> it is I, I did catch some of your uh stream with with alan about the reading it, it, you guys are discussing education and reading and that was really fascinating yeah 
Yeah, he he brings a really interesting perspective. Uh, Dr. Philip Chase had uh, Dear Dr. Fantasy with Alan, and they talked about the educational system. And if uh, you enjoyed that, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's really amazing watching two people. And, you know, uh, Philip's college professor, Alan, teaches high school. And just seeing the differences and hearing the problems that that we do have in the educational system in America is uh, frightening. <laughs> yeah. But also, uh, there couldn't be two better people at the forefront, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And well, I, I think things like Game of Thrones, I think that encourages some people to read. So it's it's nice when the, when these books get adapted because it might make people want to pick up a book and experience it. Absolutely, absolutely, so, man. Even The Witcher. I mean, I know some people who started reading The Witcher when they saw the TV show because they wanted to know more about it. So, you know, it's like even though it is getting adapted, it's still it still can open that door for some people that want to experience more of it. Yeah. And it's always a gateway, almost always. Right. Like you read something and if you enjoy it, it gets great. And that's what happened to me. You know, A Song of Ice and Fire was very formative for me as an adult. And that is what catapulted me into everything else. You know, that's why I started reading The Wheel of Time and. Honestly, even though I didn't like love the Wheel of Time, it did start to shape my taste a little bit more. And I started saying like, oh, OK, maybe because everyone said it once you finish Song of Ice Fire, where do you get the Wheel of Time? It's even better. And I'm like, well, that's subjective. <laughs> like for some people it is, but not for me. So I said, OK, well, what is something that's less like Wheel of Time and more like a Song of Ice and Fire? And then I found Joe Abercrombie. And now I'm reading things that no one else is reading. <laughs> <laughs> me you and uh like three people in the chat are, are now reading our scott baker <laughs> oh i love i love baker yeah so uh, dying for the second book yeah i'm uh, i'm excited to continue with his sequels for sure uh oscar thank you for the 10th spot my friend uh, oscar's been around on the channel for a long time he's been a patron for a long time too he said happy friday top five grimdark you recommend thank you for mm -hmm. all the book recommendations i'm gonna let you take this one steve because i think you actually have read, read more of grimdark than i have oh i'm not sure uh well i have to hear your five too so oh. off the top of my head, I would say if you want, this is tough because again, not, not all these are for everyone. So it's, it's tough. So look and, you know, read the synopsis a little bit and get a feel for, I would, I would say I, if you want something that's one that I always, that I always recommend to people, it's Priest of Bones by Peter McLean. Mm. Uh, it's like a, it, it's a, it's low fantasy. It's um, if you love the Goodfellas and like gangster movies and stuff, it's like a, it's like a gangster version of it's like Peaky Blinders, but in mid, in a mid, medieval setting. Um, and the magic, the little magic that's in it is is very well done. It's it's short, so it's not a huge investment. And uh, that's one that I would recommend is Priest of Bones. Um, I would recommend if you want to get into the darker side of Grim Dark, I think you have to read um, <laughs> Beyond Redemption by Michael R. Fletcher. That's very dark. Um, I think it's I'm I'm. May, might even say it's a little darker and bleaker than Baker's writing. Um, yeah, it's it's up there. It's pretty dark. Yikes. Uh, yeah, it's pretty dark. It's great though if you if you want to get into the darker side. And of course, I have to I have to recommend Kings of Paradise by Richard Nell. It's my favorite trilogy, the Ash and Sand trilogy. That's also dark. It does start out very dark. You can uh, read the first few pages on on Amazon and get a feel for it because the first few pages are. It starts off with a bang, so that's a good uh, read <laughs> to see if it's if you're willing to take a dip. But it's it's not. It, there are some hopeful and some inspiring moments in that series. So that's um, that's three. Let's see what else. Um, I did like we mentioned um, good Me gun metal gods by Zamel Akhtar is very good. It's another really good one. And um, what's I guess I'd recommend Prince of Nothing if you want to get into. I think it has to be on that list now that I've read it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a solid top five. I haven't read all of them. I, I really want to get to Michael Fletcher's work. Uh, I would, I, I would like to somehow squeeze that in in the next year and a half somehow. Um, <laughs> next year and a half. Yeah, I'm not going to do a full top five, but I, what I will say, and I think some people uh, now kind of, it, it's, it's a given. But man, Joe Abercrombie is a really good place to start with Grimdark. It is, yeah, because there's a flavor to what's happening and the circular nature of the narrative that I think exists in a lot of grimdark. And it's a good indicator. If you can read that and you can say, there's something about these characters and this really, really <laughs> sad situation for all of them that I enjoy. I think then it's okay to take the next step down on the ladder towards darkness. Uh, I think Abercrombie is obviously really commercially viable, but also it's because he's, he's a bit of a gateway in a lot of ways.
So like Abercrombie's not nearly as dark as any of the other stuff. No, that we're I think talking it's, about. Yeah. It's on the lighter side, I think, of Grimdark as a genre. If you if you kind of on the darkness scale, I think it's on the lighter side. And it's not light. It's it's <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it is dark, but it's not anywhere near what like something like Beyond Redemption or the Prince of Nothing is. Also, Abercrombie's just a funny guy, um, and that helps a lot when you're in these. Like Prince of Nothing had no humor. No, not that I can remember. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't stick out to me, right? The only time I smiled when reading that book is just because I love the writing so much. So I, I did reread a lot, very a lot of portions of that book just because it was so great. Yeah, I rarely do. I'm not. I'm not someone who knows. You know, I'm I'm not someone who can break down writing, and I'll, I'm just a normal guy who likes to read. So I don't. That's not really my thing. So when it when that happens, it's a special, special moment. Yeah. Do you feel like um, that's something that you are wanting to explore more? Because I have found, obviously, I, I I like writing too. Like I try to to do it as much as I can. The little free time I have right now, but it's one of those things where I can't. It's, you might be talking about pulling the veil back a little bit. That's the piece of the veil that I would like to see pull back more in my brain is understanding why people are doing things because a lot of the really successful writers that we see, we think it's just coincidental and there is a lot of luck to becoming commercially viable. However, a lot of stuff's on purpose and a lot of stuff is intentional and that is the craft of writing. So I find myself reading, I'm reading a book by John Gardner right now, not just to improve myself, but also to improve uh, how I analyze and, and how I review and, and how I judge someone's you know technical viability as a writer. And it's not something I will never make sweeping genre defining statements. That's not me. Uh, yeah. That's just not who I am, but I would like to understand on a, a deeper level of how do people use perspective uh, to enhance, the, enhance the story and things like this. Do, do you have that or are you still just kind of, uh, down with just doing your thoughts, your opinions, and talking to authors, getting their intent and stuff like that? Hmm. Good question. I think um, now that I'm reading more and more and I'm reading lot, you know, different types of books, I, I would like to know more about writing and be able to break that down a little bit better. I don't, something I, I, I don't want to become a writer, but I do want to be able to recognize when certain you know, there's sort of like tricks that you may not notice if you don't know about, if you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So there, there are times when I wish I knew more about that, that I can yeah. know how they use perspective or how they use, um, you know, language or how they, uh, how they break down sentences or how they use verbs or whatever it may be. I mean, there's, there's a lot to the craft that it's, um, it's, 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 it's a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, I think talking to authors, a lot of times when you bring up writing, I think it's almost impossible for them not to talk about the craft. Like Rocchio was really eye opening to me and I can see in his writing that he is very talented. Um, and he was talking about studying rhetoric and all these things that are, aren't taught anymore mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. schools. And he was saying, you know, if you really want to be an amazing writer, like those are the things that are forgotten. And you can just tell when you read Sun Eater, in my opinion, uh, the prose, it's not flowery or anything like that, but it's, it's it almost has a rhythm to it, but it's not poetry or anything like that or music, but it just has a good flow to it. He uses a lot of different sentence structures. His paragraphs are also very varied and the pacing of the chapters are generally congruent or at least similar to the way he's structuring his paragraphs. It's very fascinating stuff. Um, now, some people hear that and they just go, yeah. but for me, I've always been a technical guy. I've always liked yeah. to know how things work. It's why I like physics. It's why I like coding. Um, just, that's just how my brain works. But there are times, man, I turn all that shit off <laughs> and I just go, I'm just going to read the shit out of this book and, and enjoy it for what it is. Like I'm having a lot of trouble with uh, the Dandelion Dynasty explaining why I love it so much. Um, like I have things that I've talked about, but from a technical perspective, I'm not sure what it is about his writing that I find so immersive yet. I just haven't <laughs> figured it out. It's tough. Yeah, it is tough. It is tough. And there is a, it's interesting you brought, you brought that up. Um, that uh, there was a, an author recently that that sent a um, that sent a book to a, a a booktuber, and this booktuber read I think like thirty percent of the book, and then this booktuber made a video about it, like a thirty minute video, just like trashing the book. Mm. And the author responded with, uh, "There's a difference between critiquing a book and reviewing a book," and it made me think, uh, maybe consider kind of what you were. I'm talking about a second ago is, you know, breaking down the writing and I'm not, 
I'm not a critiquer of books. I'm more like a, I don't want to call myself a reviewer. I just like to talk about them, but so it's, 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 it's interesting. So you can get different perspectives with so many different yeah. uh, book and what they do. And so it, it kind of made me kind of made me wonder about that because there is, there is a difference between critiquing something and breaking it down and, and someone who just reads just to read and just to, you know, yeah. like you said, just turn your brain off sometimes and go, go along for the ride. Yeah. And you know what? Um, AP has talked about this a lot and he said, you know, there's a difference between a review and a reaction. Most of what people do on booktube are reactions. Yeah. Um, but are you going to label it that? Meh, probably not. Right. But language does matter. And um, it's tough. It's tough. And yeah. I think that there is absolutely value in someone's personal experience, especially if you know a booktuber and you right. know what they like and you say, well, I like this. Like, for instance, like I said, my friend Scott and even uh, Brent in the chat, like we agree on like 97% of the books that we read, I would say we're very, very, very close uh, in taste. And so whenever I see them post something and they have a subjective experience, say, Hey, this is trash. It's like, yeah, they're not going line by line, but like, I, tr you know, I know that that might not hit with me. Right. So there's a value in that, I think. Uh, but it is an interesting thing to think about. What is a review? What is mm -hmm. a reaction? What is a critique? Um, I don't uh, do the whole trashing of books. Uh, now I have done, uh, I mean, I've said things that were probably inflammatory because I felt that way. Like I think Cage of Souls is not a good book uh, by Adrian Shafkowski. Probably a good author. I'm going to read his other stuff. I just didn't like that book. Um, but at the same time, people can do that now, and that's fine. Like it, it is what it is, right? But I, I, this is not my flow. It's not, it's not my thing. Yeah. So, especially too. smaller authors, you know, because uh, it can... I don't want to ruin anyone's livelihood. You know, if I come on here and I trash Brandon Sanderson for six and a half hours, it does. It's not going to make a damn bit of difference in him paying his mortgage. You know what I'm saying? But an author who's trying out and it's their debut. I try to be a little bit more fair. Um, for instance, and I know you've read him before, uh, Brian Stavely. I did not enjoy the emperor's blades. I really yeah. did. Um, and I tried to be fair to that book when I reviewed it, but I, it was, I would say a, mostly negative review mm. um but i didn't i never wanted to go in and just be like this is the most trash thing ever because he's still he's starting out and uh you know it, it might be uh popular in our little corner i say this about john gwen a lot because there's a lot of people who read john gwen they go ah this is trash blah 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 and it's like or people say the best word overrated this is so overrated and it's like to who <laughs> the 10,000 people in our little corner like relax this guy you know he's trying to be uh you know make this a full-time gig and things like that. And I'm not saying you can't trash it. Um, mm -hmm. You can do that, but uh, it can actually have a majorly negative impact uh, for yeah. someone who's just trying to do what they love. It's tough. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's been an author that I've, I've does has kind of confided to me a little bit. And there was a booktuber who did a, a, a bigger booktuber who did a, a semi, it was almost like a lukewarm review of, of the book and on good reason, there was actually a dip in sales because of it. So that, gave me pause too to think that it does have a big impact on these smaller writers and if i don't like something i, I won't really say much about it i'll just kind of let it go and um i'm not gonna you know like you said i'm not gonna just and even if it is like a stephen king or whoever i'm not gonna just not my not my thing you know just yeah if i don't like something i'll just move on and go find something i do enjoy yeah i, I wouldn't say that i shy away from negative reviews um more so than i vet books very hard before i read them most of the time yeah. Um, now with the Patreon random pick of the month, that gets hairy because it's like, hey, I didn't pick this. Might be something way out of my wheelhouse. Who knows? They've all been good so far, which is great. Um, but it's not. It's only if I have something to say. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like even with Stavely's uh, book, even though I I did not enjoy it so much, I still thought that there was a lot of promise there. I was almost disappointed more than anything because I was like, there was a lot here that could have worked. And it's like, maybe his next trilogy could be for me. Um, yeah. So it's only whenever I have something to say, but you know, on the flip side of that, Steve, I do that for positive or uh, positive reviews for books. If I don't feel like I have anything to add to the conversation, if you go back on my channel, I don't have a first law trilogy review for the first trilogy. I didn't have anything to say. I just loved it. Yeah. And I didn't pay attention to the nitty gritty details of like the writing or anything. Cause one, I didn't really understand anything like that back then, but two, I was just having fun, dude. Like I was just, you know, I could have done a vlog. That would have been a good, you know, of me crying at moments or whatever, you know, that would have been more interesting, but I never felt like I had anything to add to that conversation. So I just didn't make the video. You know, I don't make a, a video for every book I read. So, yeah. Um, I, I, so I, uh, I'm never, 
well, I shouldn't say never because never say never, but uh, I generally don't come on and just like, you know, say this book is a heaping pile of trash and this guy should never write again, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but I also will not uh, shy away from doing a negative review if I feel like I have something to say about it. So it just depends. Yeah. It's a good point. And I, I haven't done a, a first thought thing either because I think it's been, every, everything's been said about that series and it's hard to find something new. Like you said, what are you going to add to that conversation mm -hmm. that hasn't already been said? That's why I like reading, uh, you know, indie and self pub because, you know, there's not a whole lot of attention on those books yet. And I, that's, it's fun to introduce people to books that they may not have heard of before. So, yeah. Yeah. I love Philip's take on this. He said, my personal rule for reviewing is to pretend the author is sitting there listening to me because they might be, uh, doesn't mean I'm not critical, but I always try to explain my criticism and keep it respectful. Yes. I agree with that. hundred really percent. Yeah. Philip was yeah. great at doing that. That's a really good policy to have. And I usually do try to uh, pretend that whoever I'm making the review about will see it. Um, now that doesn't mean that I owe them a positive review, but yeah. you know, I, I try to try to keep it uh, 100 as the kids say nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. feel like when it comes to negative reviews that if you try hard enough, you can tear down anything? Uh, it depends on your on how much of a platform you have. I think, um, yeah. if you like someone who's a, like, a, if you have a lot of people that are, you, you could. I mean, depending on who what you're trashing, it could have an impact. I guess. I, I guess what I'm saying more so is, you could go into something, any piece of work, any book, and if you look hard enough, you can trash it. Oh yeah, you know yeah, what I'm for, saying. Yeah, yeah. I, if you, I mean, you, you'll find something in every in anything if you really looked hard enough, but. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's a bad book and you enjoy it and you know, it's bad, but you still like it. Like there's movies that you hate that you should hate, but you really like just because battlefield earth. Yeah. That movie is ter objectively terrible and I love it so yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> battlefield earth dude, when John Travolta pulls the head out of the canister, he's like, you mean this? It's like the funniest scene in cinema, but it's not supposed to be hilarious. It's uh, if you've never seen battlefield earth, it's worth your, well, it's not worth your time. But if okay. you feel like throwing away an hour and a half, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's a Scientology movie. It's literally written by Scientologists, acted out by Scientologists. It's wild, dude. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah, I've avoided that one just because it looked, I think, you know, when it came out back in the, was it, 90s? Yeah, maybe early 2000s, late uh, 90s, something like that. Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah. It, look, it looked pretty bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dude, it's so bad. I, a lot of people think it's the worst like Hollywood produced movie of all time. Cause it had a huge budget too. Um, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's literally considered by many people. If you go on like a list, like rotten tomatoes and stuff, I guarantee you it's in the bottom five guarantee you it's in the bottom five. There's no wow. way. I love it. Yeah. See, JR knows what I'm talking about. Battlefield Earth is awesome for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, Starship Troopers, Starship Troopers is amazing because it doesn't take itself serious. Unlike the book. Uh, but the movie doesn't take itself serious. You know, I'm doing my part. Battlefield yeah. Earth is that, but it's taking itself serious. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Starship, Starship, Starship Troopers is great because, like you said, it, it knows what it's doing and it's just unapologetically cheese. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 that cheesiness works for me, especially in a sci fi setting for some reason. Um, Commander says, Ugh, I don't like Battlefield Earth. Jimmy Scientology doesn't deserve your money or attention. Well, I, I would agree, but I didn't spend any money on it. So don't worry. Yeah, no, no harm done there. Um, and, and it's also terrible. So th that that's kind of a consolation prize. I think <laughs> I read the book back before the movie came out. Battlefield Earth. You did. I heard it's terrible. I heard the books even worse. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, Ridley Scott's comments that he made after was the last duel that it, the reason the movie failed is because millennials are too involved in their phones and their attention spans are ruined because of social media. What were your thoughts on that? That's a hard, uh, hard sell to get someone to watch your next movie. Ridley Scott's. <laughs> I don't think making generalizations about a group of people is ever a good idea. I mean, when has that ever worked out? Yeah. Not it's once. Like old man yells at cloud kind of thing is what, you know, you kind of, your mind goes to. I mean, let me tell you what though, Ridley Scott doing pu his publicity after the last duel is what they should have done for marketing beforehand. <laughs> Ridley Scott just being a grumpy old man is the most entertaining thing, even though he's wrong. The funny shit. Did you see the one uh, interview where someone was like, do, like, do you think that the, um, like the, uh, the viewers should be questioning like what, it, what's true and what's not and what's because of all the different perspectives. And Ridley Scott's just like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> oh, dude, he just dumps on this interview and he's like, seriously, how stupid are you? Wow. <laughs> I I loved it. I thought, I mean, it's incredibly rude, but I was just like, dude, I want to watch The Last Duel now. I still haven't watched it and I'm supposed to watch it so me and AP can talk about it. He wants to bring me on and, and we, we talked about it down in Florida too, uh, but I need to watch it and I just don't. I don't have two and a half hours to sit down. I, I struggle to sit for two and a half hours and watch a movie anymore. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, that's funny. And I, I think it's, I've heard it's okay. I've heard it, it's not as bad as it, as the reviews were, uh, that came oh, I, in. But I heard it's really good. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. just, just keep really Scott away from the alien franchise. That's all I want. Just all keep right. him, give him something else to do. Let him make another last little movie. Go away. Listen, I'm going to be honest. And this is my, uh, this is so listen folks when i talk about movies this is one thing you're never going to see from jimmy nuts here at the fantasy network you're never going to see me transition into being like tv and movie reviews because i don't know anything about you know when people say like oh that had like really bad cgi i don't know what that means um <laughs> like I, I legit i have no idea what that i mean, can say it uh and even sometimes i can say oh i think that was bad and people are like yeah that was really bad and i'm like i don't know why it was bad other than it looked funky, but like, I don't know the difference of these things. Uh, so you'll never see me transition into like a media reviewer ever. Um, I like Prometheus. I might be the, I think I'm the, am I the only person in the world that likes Prometheus? I, I liked it when I dropped all of my expectations. I liked it. It's a hard science fiction. I, I like if it was a standalone movie, it'd be a lot better. I think the way it tied into the rest of the series is I think he tried to, to kind of combine Blade Runner and the Alien franchise instead of just letting the Alien franchise be its own thing. He tried to make a like a, a shared universe, and that's what I wasn't a big fan of. I mean, people seem to really hate Prometheus. Now, here, this is the this is where I lose one thousand subscribers from saying this. Steve, I gotta come clean, bro. Okay, bro, I've never seen Alien. Oh no. <laughs> I've never seen it. Oh, no. I saw Prometheus I'm like this is dope. And you're like, go watch Alien. I'm like, that stuff's old. I ain't watching. <laughs> oh no, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I just know how, how so many people are mad. Oh no. Alien Aliens is probably my, one of my favorite movies. Aliens is great. Alien is really good too, but for different reasons and. And it, you, you'd look at, you'd watch a movie like Alien now and what Sigourney Weaver did in that role, and I won't spoil anything, but it was must have been huge at the time of, you know, just to have a woman in that kind of role, but it's a great movie. I've seen clips because they used to play on like the Superstation, like all the time back in the day, right? But I've never actually sat down and watched it like cover to cover or whatever, start to end. I always say cover to cover for books. Um, but I, how about this? I'll watch it. Okay. I'll watch it and we can talk about it. Okay. Yeah, oh, that's... Philip. Philip's my dude. He hasn't seen it either. <laughs> oh no, Philip, you have to join us for that discussion then. Oh. I, I do agree with Star that we need do do not need to talk about Alien Resurrection. That movie, I'm still trying to burn it out of my memory. <laughs> Awful. Awful. Now, is that after Prometheus or no? It's uh, it's before Prometheus. The events of Prometheus. Prometheus is what happened before the events of Alien. Okay. I think I might have seen Alien Resurrection and enjoyed it. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, I don't like good movies. It's just, it is what it is, guys. I don't know. Um, Jimmy, have you seen Event Horizon? Yes, and I love Event Horizon. Is that a bad movie? Am I wrong there, too? I like Event Horizon. Okay, I thought Event Horizon was dope because it's like horror almost, and I love sci-fi horror. Yeah, sci-fi and horror, it's it's a good mix. Have you watched uh, Raised by Wolves on HBO? Ridley Scott did the pilot. I haven't. I've I've uh, I've been sour on Ridley Scott after uh, what was the last Alien movie? Well, whatever one it was, I don't know. <laughs> but no, I, I want to see it. I just haven't seen. It. Have you Have you seen it? So I watched the first. I almost watched the entire thing. It was coming out week by week. So I fell off right before the finale of season one, and I thought it was really good. But then it started meandering in the middle. Like the Ridley Scott pilot is dope, mm. um, but it kind of meandered a little bit. And then honestly. I've been seeing alt shift X covering it uh, for season two. And I tuned in for a second and he was like, so this person turned into, I I can't say because it's a spoiler, but he said like, he said something that happened and I go, what? I was like, that happened. And so now, and he's laughing like an alt shift X is like 
I love that guy. I think he's the best YouTuber of all time. And he's just like, yeah. So, you know, in his accent, he's like, that's an effing thing. Like, that's crazy. And I'm like, dude, this guy is making me want to watch it. So I, I turned off the stream and I think I'm going to watch it uh, specifically just to see how they get to this point in season two. And I've heard from a lot of people. Season two is infinitely better, but also one of the most bizarre, like go for it type of sci fi's ever. And I love that stuff, dude. I love when things get weird. It's like my yeah. favorite. I'm there for it. Yeah, dude. So I might, I might try Raised by Wolves again, and I will watch the original Alien. Um, it's, it's on the list. I've also never seen Blade Runner, so uh, that's another one that I need to watch. Blade Runner's tough. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I've heard the first one is like a hit or miss for people. I've heard more people like um, Dil, uh, Dennis Villanueva. I always say his name wrong. I don't know if it's been a, yeah. It's, yeah. Dennis. Or Vian. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll call him Dude. Big D. Yeah, he's done some great movies. <laughs> yeah, he sure has. Dune was phenomenal. You saw Dune, I assume. Yeah. And he also did, there was a movie called Enemy with Jake Gyllenhaal. Dude, That's, that movie's so good. Yes. So good. Yes. Someone's finally seen that, dude. I love that movie. Jake Gyllenhaal's my favorite actor. He's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I love Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, Jimmy, have you seen Man of Steel? Yeah, I saw it in theaters when it came out. I'm not big into superhero stuff. Uh, I didn't like it. Is that a bad opinion? I don't think people are um, indifferent. People are, are mixed on on those movies. I'm I'm a fan of the DC stuff. So okay, I see. I really like the Superman movies from the 80s when I was a kid. I think they were 80s. Uh, yeah. Like when they had the black suit Superman. I love that movie. That was dope. Um, so I was excited for Man of Steel, and I was still I think a teenager when that came out. And uh, I just remember going to the theater and just being like, this was not good. Like, it should have been good. And it just, I didn't like it. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, I'm not into comics or superhero stuff. So I'm like the worst person in the world to have opinions on these things. Yeah, like the Marvel stuff I have no interest in. Just not for me. Really? What about it uh, makes you not like the Marvel stuff? It's um, it's just nothing's ever at stake. And you you know the good guys are going to win. And um, yeah, it's just not, not my cup of tea. But I, I get a lot of people like it, so. Yeah, well, that's uh, always been my hang up with comics and superhero stuff. Now, I know comics have arcs where they can get like I know Batman, for instance, has like a lot of really cool, like almost like limited series. I don't know what they're called in comic, but like contained arcs. Mm -hmm. um, like, isn't there the Halloween one that's supposed to be really cool and dark? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So that stuff kind of intrigues me. Maybe one day I'll check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've always just thought the plot armor was a little too much. And I've always been a bigger fan of like larger casts. Um, yeah. And even books like, for instance, like Realm of the Elderlings, like Fitz is the main character. It's a first person perspective. But that 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 series has some of the best side characters of all time, in my opinion. So even whenever you have a focused narrative in first person, you can still build out a tremendous cast. Uh, and it's not to say that uh, comics don't do that as well. I mean, there's a lot of comics that have really good side characters, too. So I'm probably not being fair <laughs> to, to comics. Uh, and I know you like comics, so I apologize. Uh, well, but... I, I mostly read like horror comics. I didn't read superhero comics. Uh, there was some that I that I enjoyed. Like uh, there were some authors that I would follow, like Garth Ennis. He wrote um, The Boys. He wrote that was a, mm -hmm. his his, uh, his book and he wrote some other. So there are certain authors that I would follow. Um, there's some stuff I just wasn't interested in. Yeah. yeah, Sunshine is really good. If you like to Event Horizon, Sunshine is really good. I love Sunshine and I love Moon, which I've heard people actually hate Moon. Like, I guess if you watch it again, you're like, none of it makes sense. But I don't care about any of that. I thought Moon was great. Sunshine, fun. Um, I did try to watch The Tomorrow War with Chris Pratt on Amazon Prime, and I thought it was really bad. Like, I was like 45 minutes in. And I was like, this sucks, <laughs> which which is depressing because I was like, sci-fi, big budget. Like, that'll be cool. Yeah. Not great. I didn't even bother. But yeah, yeah, Sunshine and Moon is really good. Yeah, I like Moon. Uh, apparently, people hate it. I, lo I loved it. I thought it was great. I actually watched Moon and Sunshine like back to back. Um, I, that was back when I used to actually get DVDs from Netflix in the mail. That was mm. Way oh, back yeah. in the day, dude. Yeah, yeah I remember that. <laughs> Someone said 2,000 subscribers down now. <laughs> uh, so you read horror, uh, horror comics. What other ones did you like? Um, I well, there's some really dark stuff that I read, but there was some. Uh, Garth Ennis wrote more other horror comics that like crossed. That it's really survival horror. Uh, it's very violent and dark and disturbing. So I think that's why I'm sliding into horror and grim dark now. And when I read uh, my books, so yeah, horror is like a genre that um, I'd like to dip my toes into a little bit more because I always just go back to Sa King, and I also do. I did um, um, crap. Only good Indians. Stephen Graham Jones. Am I getting it right? I'm blanking on his name. 
Um, I thought that was a great book and it really had some cool twists to it. I like the way the guy writes. I mean, he writes in a bizarre way as well that I think adds to the atmosphere and I'm going to continue to read him every year around Halloween. Um, but I'd like to dip my toes a little bit more in horror. I just don't know where to start. Cause I love horror movies. Like that's my jam. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's so many great horror books out there. So many talented authors. It's, I think horror is going through a renaissance right now. There's so many great, uh, so much, there's so many great books out there. So, All right. Yeah. If you could give me one horror book, not by Stephen King to, to suck me into the genre, what would it be? Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. What kind of, what kind of horror are you like survival grief? What do you, what do you kind of, what's, what's your... uh, I'm down to anything. Um, I, I mean, movie wise, I always like paranormal stuff. Uh, I'm not so much into vampires and werewolves though. I think I like vampires more than I give myself credit for. <laughs> It's one of those things where I'm like, I don't really like it. But then I think about it. I'm like, oh, I love Salem's Lot. I love Fever Dream by George R. R. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I like Blade. So I think I actually do like vampires. But werewolves, not really my thing. Let me, um, let me, let me check my... And survival check. horror, I'm in. Like, I'm all in on survival horror. Oh, okay. Post-apocalyptic especially. Let me take a look really quick for a, for a five-star. Oh, if you like... Are you into uh, extreme horror? What's, what's that mean? Uh, ex like... Yeah, um, <laughs> disturbing stuff. Uh, but off the top of my, off the top of my head, um, oh, I don't know why I didn't think of this. If you like, and they're novellas, but the dream, the um, the uh, Nightmare Land Chronicles by Daniel Barnett. I've so, heard of these. So good. And I own novellas, book, so they're easy to read. I think I own book one, actually. I tell you what, how, wait, how long? How long is the first one? Is it it's like very short? Pages. All right, I'll read it in October. <laughs> yeah, remind me. Okay, I'll remind you. And, uh, <laughs> and there's also uh, like only the stains remain is really good. That's another one that's a little, little disturbing. Um, hmm. there's, there's some of the Crossroads by Laura Hightower is really good. That's has a little bit of paranormal in it. It's a, uh, it's pretty pretty. It, that'll keep you thinking after you finish it. Just looking at my list here. There's there's a lot of great sh uh, short story collections too in horror. I love short story horror. Oh, love it. Check out Nocturne, a collection Nocturne? of tales by H.B. Diaz. So good. Anything but by Mike Thorne is really good. I I can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll check out uh, that for sure. The Crossroads one sounds good, and then Nocturne. I love short story collections uh, in horror. I King stuff has always been my favorite, but I'd like to branch out. You know. Yeah. Uh, Star wants to know both of you. Have you watched Six String Samurai? I have no idea what that is. I haven't. Yeah, I have no idea. And then Shelf and Stable said, "Have you seen Nightcrawler, uh, Jill and All's best movie?" Yes, I love Nightcrawler. I saw it in theaters. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah, it's really good. I, I do like Enemy more though. Yeah, if I'm thinking just off the top of my head, Enemy is like one of my favorite movies in the last like ten years. If I'm being yeah. honest, like I really love that movie, and I watched it on a whim. It was like Netflix threw it up there. Like you like Jake Gyllenhaal. Here's other movies from him, and I and I clicked on it, and it was just like a surprise, you know. It was like one of those nights I just picked the movie up, and there's something about that spontaneous enjoyment. Yeah. I, I, it happens with books a lot too. If you ever like bought a book at the bookstore on a whim, and then you read it and you just love it, that's what happened with me with Malice. Oh, nice. Yeah, I just started reading. I was like, man, I kind of like this. And then you start looking online, and I remember seeing Patrick's reviews, and I was like, okay, like some other people like this too. That's kind of cool. And then I just got into it, and I just rifled through it. It was one of the first series I read when I got back, but I remember my wife saw the cover and she's like, I kind of like that cover. I was like, yeah, it's kind of dope. Malice is a dope name. And then that was it. It's a great cover. It is. Have you ever had that though? Have you ever picked up a spontaneous thing from the store and then it'd just be a hit? Um, I can't think of any, I, I've, I've picked up some stuff on Amazon. It's been a hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that counts. Yeah, with the pandemic, it's it's been tough. You know, now that things are reopening, it's been easier to go to a bookstore. Things that we took for granted before. Yeah, but for real. I think something like um, that I picked up just kind of on a whim that I really enjoyed was um, was Crossroads by Laura Hotower. I didn't really know what to expect with that one, but that turned out to be really good. One of my favorite of last year. Yeah, I uh, I think that that one is probably one that sounds the most interesting to me, just based on the praise you just gave it. <laughs> And then saying it had a little bit of paranormal. I think that's the one I'm most interested in reading. I did have the, uh, the Daniel Barnett. Is that what his name was? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely have those because Andrews wizardly reads it. And, uh, Leslie, uh, have both talked about that before and said that they were really, really good. 
they are next level stuff. The first book is really disorienting. So you're a little confused after the first book. But once you get into book two and three, and they're, real, they're shorter books when you're used to 600 page books, it's yeah. a nice little break. But it's, yeah, it's that series is something else. Bro, I got one for you. Do you do audiobooks? I don't. I, I should fine. more often. That's I, fine. Yeah. Uh, it, you don't have to do audio. I just think the audio is fantastic. But Hellmouth by uh, Giles Christian is a novella i think it's 60 something pages and it's oh. based in 14th century bohemia and it's like medieval horror oh nice bro it's it's totally worth your time i thought it was phenomenal well, here we go i would probably put in my top 10 books of the year if i made a list right now and it's and it's like 60 or 70 pages i think uh the audiobook is just excellent um but i think it, just reading it would also be very good i, I picked up a, a couple other things from giles christian since then um and another one that's horror fantasy type related it's like historical horror is between two fires yeah um, i did I read that one a couple months ago oh you did yeah did you love it i liked it i didn't love it but it, okay. it was good yeah yeah that's one i've been uh, recommended a lot and i really want to get into it mm. oh finally somebody else that loves fever dream that makes me so happy uh, have you ever heard of fever dream Actually, you know, it's funny you brought it up because uh, there was a it was adapted into a comic book many years ago that I read. It was really? A, yeah. So I, I didn't know who George R. R. Martin was at the time, but I read I was reading the comic book. It's like a six issue uh, miniseries, but yeah, I had no idea who the hell George R. R. Martin was. <laughs> and I recognize the name from when Game of Thrones was, uh, you know, on TV. It's like I remember that that person's name, George Railroad Martin. Yeah. I'll, I'll drive up to Santa Fe and go ask him to get to work. Yeah, come on. I, I hear Santa Fe is beautiful. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Great food. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of authors in New Mexico because Daniel Abraham lives there as well as Stephen Donaldson. Uh, he doesn't live in Santa Fe, but uh, I think he lives in Albuquerque, I believe. Yeah, I think um, that's – he wrote um, Donaldson. He wrote Thomas Covenant. Um, he wrote – many other things as well that I'm blanking on. Uh, but Donaldson was at the ICFA conference and in Orlando and I got to speak to him and he was so kind. So very kind and sharp, very sharp. Yeah. There's uh, the one, one half of the authors who wrote um, the expanse series lives here too. Yeah. Ty Franck. Yeah. Yep. Ty Franck. And, uh, yeah. I think Ty Franck and Abraham both live in Santa Fe. It's pretty oh. dope. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think they both do because they're not as involved with George's work anymore, but they're very, very good friends. And actually, if uh, on the forward of Dagger and Coin, a Abraham talks about having a kind of a party at Santa Fe and like talking to George and some other people at the time and it giving him like the motivation to go home and like start working on this fantasy thing. And wow. uh, really, really cool stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, no disclaimer says, Jimmy, have you seen all shift X top 10 greatest warriors in Westeros? If so, the thoughts on Ned and Oberyn not making the list. I actually haven't watched that. Um, so I'm going to watch it because it's all shift X, but I actually don't like necessarily care for those type of videos. Um, but Oberyn not making the list is a kind of weird Ned. I can understand, which might be a hot take, but I could, I could see that. I've never been real big on those or like versus videos. This, this never been for me. Yeah. Oh, good night, Philip. Good night, Philip. Yes, and Philip will be a special guest on uh, the Charity Jeopardy, uh, Ch uh, Jeopardy of Champions, I think, is or Champion Jeopardy or something, uh, on Sunday. But it'll be on Alan's channel at 12 p.m. noon. I will be doing a pre-show at noon with Sarah Reeds. We're going to be hyping up the contestants and kind of speculating on who's going to do what. I think Alan's going to have a tough time because he doesn't read any good books. So uh, that'll be tough for him. Uh, but I'm really excited about that. And the main event will start at 1 p.m., folks. Then that's over on Alan's channel. Um, we have a lot of really cool... Um, little surprises for everyone. So uh, it's it's been a pretty big production and I got to give Sarah Reeds a huge shout out because she has put in a ton of work to get this all set up. And I think when it all comes together, it's going to be one of the best live shows, if not ever on booktube history. Or if that's, that's is that a thing? Yeah, sure. That's sure. A, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, we're think, really excited. I think it's, it's uh, I think you take some... It, it, I didn't know how much time went into all this kind of stuff until you get into it. So it's a lot of time to set things up like that. So, yeah, I, it, you know, even like this, you know, the, it, you know, you set it up, you got these things, but then whenever you're trying to coordinate, I think a total, we have almost like 12 people involved. Wow. 
So it's it's a lot because it's not just the contestants, but we have some cameos and such planned, and and then also do, getting the live show of uh, the pre-show to get it all hyped up and things like that. Uh, I'm very impressed with Sarah's dedication to a really good cause, uh, which it'll be obviously for charity for refugees for um, you know everything that's going on over in Europe right now. So um, I think it'll be a it's going to be amazing. And Daniel Green even uh, pushed it in Fantasy News, which uh, you know what, kudos to him that that was uh, very kind of him. Uh, and again, it's for a good cause, so it's mm-hmm. going to be a lot of fun. Really, I'm I'm pumped for it, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I really wanted to go over the, over the top with it and be like John Madden and like drawing on the screen, like put out clips of Alan giving books bad ratings, be like, this is going to be a problem right here. You know, <laughs> just like stupid. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Brett <Yeah>. Favre. <laughs> Gorilla says, hey, Jimmy, I know you've been reading a good about of uh, manga with Vinland Saga and Berserk. Yes, and I am very much enjoying both. I think they're both excellent. I missed the horror short story convo. Uh, well, Joe R. Lansdale is the king there. Cool. Uh, who is doing the halftime show as a surprise? It's a surprise. Also, I don't know. <laughs> Sarah knows that I've, I've been trying to help out, but hunting this house down and reading Grace of Kings is at all my attention. Uh, and then I have my job, you know, that I'm supposed to pay attention oh, yeah. to. That. Yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> That experience been looking for a new place it's it's a is it a good time to buy or a bad time to buy <sighs> well um it's 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 not good i would say it's it's very bad uh to give everyone an idea uh you know uh we tried to uh buy a house put an offer very generous offer we were well over asking price tens of thousands of dollars over asking uh and it got bought out with someone who just had like 100k cash and uh on so you're already 60 grand over asking that's a lot yeah. Also, houses are going with no inspections. Yes. Which is an insane. And 60 day rent backs for free. So the person gets to sell you the house and live in it for free for two months. That's the kind of terms that you're looking at right now to be competitive. Wow. And most people are going to say, where do you live? Well, it's like this everywhere. <laughs> it, it, maybe not everywhere, but a lot of places. Um, so it's it's very, very hard right now. Um, thankfully, you know, we'll be we'll get a house. You know, it'll be fine. But I, I do worry about um others i just i don't i don't know how i don't have this is sustainable but i also don't have the answers to those questions so i just try to let it go (laughs) i was so mad we didn't get the last house that i uh woke up at 3 a.m on like tuesday just pissed off and then i just i just got up and read for the day like i was literally just up from three to like midnight um like all day but i got a lot of reading done so that was nice (laughs) yeah I, I find whenever like this kind of stuff happens, like these shows and reading uh, the, the value in this, like really comes out for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's not, and a lot of the houses here, I know that our housing market, the, the houses are, um, I forget what the, what the term is, but basically people buy them without ever walking through them. They just throw an offer out and they buy it. And, they, uh, and so houses are only on the market for a couple of days and they're gone. Yeah, the supply is very low and the demand is very high because even though interest rates are climbing, they're historically still extraordinarily low. You know, anything below seven, eight percent, which they still are for now, is still really good. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, <clears throat> pretty wild, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is wild. I need people to stop buying surprises that can come back down to earth. Yeah. You know, you look at all those fancy collector's editions and you go, maybe I shouldn't have bought all those. Bikes. <laughs> you start to question your, your spending habits. When it comes to, uh... Yeah. You know, uh, you definitely have to reanalyze. You got to do the autopsy uh, and see where, see where everything went. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just bought the dragon bone chair from Grim Oak press, uh, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, and then I also had the subterranean press of gardens of the moon coming. Um, but apparently they messed up. This is, uh, this is terrible news. Uh, so apparently they got them back and they were getting ready to ship them. And they realized that like some of the print was off. So that hmm. they ship all of the books back to the printer. So it's delayed. But on top of that, I'm like thinking, I'm like, Oh God, like, you know, I, I don't know. How, how do you fix that? Like, are they just going to reprint them? I really hope that subterranean has been around long enough and has a good enough reputation where I don't think it's going to be a problem, but I'm a little nervous because that's not a cheap book. Yeah. At <laughs> all. So. Oh, it's uh, yeah. Sight, sight unseen. I think Eric mentioned it in the chat is the term for it. Sight unseen. Yeah. Oh, the where is that? They're, they're just buying houses. Uh, sight unseen. They just. Yeah. You know, don't even walk through them and they're, they're picking them up wild man it is wild 
it's very hard for the common folk and a lot of it is companies like i i, I have strong suspicions that uh, i lost to a company possibly which yeah. is not cool yeah not well, cash money a lot of businesses, even like I don't know if you don't call them small businesses, but I know people who would flip houses and they just buy houses and yep. flip them. So it's a per, you know that's a lucrative right now. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where um, it's always hurting the the smallest person, and that that pisses me off a lot. Yeah. Those are the injustices that Alan gets fired up about, and I do too. <laughs> we may have sat at a table in Florida and just yelled <laughs> about injustices for like an hour. <laughs> Uh, notice we said, where did you hear about the sub press Jimmy? Cause I ordered one too. I actually heard about it. Uh, I didn't get an email. Everyone else got an email. I didn't get one. Um, but they made a post on the Malazan subreddit and someone took a picture and showed it to me in my discord. That's how I saw it. Um, I heard that the email went to a lot of people's spam and I just empty my spam. I very rarely look. So I probably missed the email that way. So, yeah, that's yeah. scary. It is scary. Yeah. It was, was not. It is it a hardcover or what is it? Is a it's a hardcover. It's a re-release of that beautiful Animanda Rake, like his back pulling Dragnapur out. Um, just, I mean, I think it's one of the best book covers of all time. I'm so excited about it, um, and I hope they keep re-releasing them because that's a series that I would 100 percent get every single one of them um, because it's really hard to find a good matching set. A Malazan as is. I have a, the trade paperbacks, but they're not matching. You know, they're different heights and all kinds of stuff. Um, but that's a series that one, the art is phenomenal in the subterranean press. And it's just a series that I think I'm going to probably read so many times. So yeah. many times. What was, what was it like meeting everybody in Florida? Was that were you nervous or what was that experience like? Nah, man, I don't get nervous for stuff too often. You know what I mean? Like, like, is there a general, uh, like a excitement, a buzz? Yeah. But no, I wasn't really worried because, you know, when you do something like this, and you do it multiple times. I mean, this is very, this is very similar to doing something in person. Now there is a magic to in person that, that you don't have with the zoom or whatever, but um, you know, I know exactly who Philip is. I know exactly who Joanna is. I know exactly who Alan is. Um, I know exactly who AP and Erickson were. So no, no, it, it didn't really uh, make me nervous. I guess you always wonder, you're like, Oh, like, I hope I don't come across different in person. And Alan told me, he said, you know, I'm actually, uh, a lot different in person and he was not he was he was i mean he was better in person to be honest i love talking to him uh because his energy is so contagious even through the screen but when you're next to him and he's slamming the table talking about the injustices of the educational system it makes you want to like go like pick it or something man like it gets you going like you just want to throw a malt of cocktail through like a you know principal's window or something uh <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like I, he, he has such a contagious energy. Um, it was amazing. And I never wanted it to end. Like it was so relaxing, which is a weird thing to say, but like, it felt like a vacation. man. It just felt like a vacation with friends. And uh, I wish that I had seen Alan and Joanna even more. I spent the entire time with AP Erickson and Philip, and they were just all so kind. And, you know, by day two, it's not, um, even like, you know, someone like Steven Erickson, it's not so much like a, oh, I'm with Steven Erickson. It's like, oh, I'm with one of my friends and yeah. you know we're getting lunch together and we're talking about movies and it's just fun. It's fun. And I even told them I like Battlefield Earth. So <laughs> they didn't shun you. They didn't. No, uh, they, they most people ag agreed with me that it's hilariously amazing. Like, it's so bad that it's awesome, you know, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it was really chill. And I would love and I don't have any experience in this, but I'd love to do a book to con. I think it would be small enough. I mean, I think it would be big enough to be worth it, but I also think it would be small enough to where it's not a massive headache, um, but never underestimate the power of the people, I guess. Where were you thinking about having it? But did you have a location picked? Honestly, Orlando was pretty great. I can't, I can't lie. Um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of flights to there. Uh, the hotels are relatively cheap depending on where it is. There's also a strong concentration of booktubers in Florida. <laughs> um like leslie uh, there's a ton of people down there i'm not going to continue to dox people uh but there's a lot of people in florida uh <laughs> but i think that the weather would probably uh cooperate so yeah that's it. i'm just throwing out so you know i'm not going to organize this unnecessarily but there's been talks before of like certain cons for fandoms right uh mm -hmm. certain book series and such but i would love to do a book tube con that'd be great wouldn't it all the panels would be so easy because we do it all the time like like, if, you know, if you get 20 booktubers, you could fill three days of panels easily. What would you do? Any ideas for panels? 
Oh, I mean, take a take a shot. I mean, it, I could do a chatting with nuts live, uh, which would be really really cool. I think that there would be a lot of discussion around, um, you know, viability. Uh, like what's commercially viable is something that I really like talking about, and it would be really cool if we got authors to also join in on that because I think sometimes what becomes commercially viable is not always the best for the art and the genre. Yeah. Um, and that goes for anything. And I'm a huge song of ice and fire fan, but I think the fact that for like 10 years, it was just trying to find the next game of Thrones. wasn't actually great for the genre. Uh, I wonder if this will happen with the Sanderson uh, influence. If we're going to see hard magic systems become a mainstay, like really popular in the next 10 years or so. Uh, and for me, it's just more like, I like, I like diversity, not just, you know, in my cast of characters or anything, but also in ideas uh, and people that are not afraid to break the mold. Unfortunately, someone breaks the mold and it's successful in the commercial sphere. It's just like Hollywood. They're just like, well, we got to copy it. We got to do it. So it's dead. Uh, and that's what happened. So I would, I think that would be a neat panel. And then you could do panels on any of the individual series that we're talking about. I mean, you could easily run a panel talking about self pub, right? I mean, you, you have a lot of experience with that. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'd be down for that. That'd be dope, right? Hell yeah. So I, I think a booktube con would be uh, majorly successful. And I think it would also be um, a lot of fun. Selfishly, it's just because I want to meet all my friends. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing is it's just a, an excuse to get together and hang out and talk about books. <laughs> it's fun stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't think it would be uh, it would be pretty relaxed. That was the one thing about the ICFA conference I was really surprised about because these are scholars. I mean, there's authors and there's scholars, people presenting their thesis. There was a thesis paper presented. Um, by a gentleman who talked about how the empire of Mil and Malazan is actually absent of a patriarchy. There's no patriarchy there and where everything else published in that era for the most part, uh, that at least was successful. You know, there's just an inherent patriarchy in it. Uh, and S Steve Erickson was able to not do that. Also not really call attention to it. Like it wasn't like, Hey, I'm not doing this. It just was. And there's like a lot of beauty in that, I think. And the fact that it was also based on the gaming sessions means that they were doing it even earlier. And it was always the intent. It wasn't something to, you know, give it some flair for publishing. That was always the intent of that world, which is really cool. Uh, and listening to someone present a paper like that is easily something that could get presented at a booktube con and be very successful. Um, but ICFA was just really relaxed. People were very approachable and very kind. I mean, nerds are generally pretty kind, right? yeah i think it depends on i think in general yeah i think certain fandoms can get kind of kind of nasty but overall definitely yeah uh, honestly sometimes the infighting is worse than the uh than the warring of two fandoms against each other like i've seen you know i've, I've been in the asana by some fire fandom for a while i'm pretty it's the only one i'm like really deep in on um and i've seen some nasty <laughs> like creators i love like going at each other's throats and stuff uh, but for the most part, it's pretty peaceful, I think. Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly, surprisingly so, yeah. Yeah, well, it's also who we attract as our audiences. So I don't see it a lot, right? Uh, by because yeah. I don't promote that and, I, and I, I don't do that myself. So I like to think that a good chunk of the audience that, that we attract are, are because they represent us in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think you the, the energy that you put out and the kind of what you focus on is what you're going to get back. So it's... Yeah. Be careful with that. Yeah. But it's right. Yeah. Do you do you pay attention to analytics and stuff in your channel? Do you pay attention to uh, retention rates and all that kind of back backdoor stuff? I do not. Um, I will pay attention if something comes up in the comments. Um, mm -hmm. Like if people are, are saying, hey, 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 this is bad, you know, and it's like a ton, you know, you got to listen to people. Yeah. Um, the analytics, I mean, you know, I have, I check the views and stuff, but I don't say, Oh, this thumbnail bombed. I better change my thumbnail. If you actually, you go to my channel, I've been doing the same stuff for a long time. It's just, uh, I like uniformity more and continuity than I do AB testing and stuff like that. Um, uh, but for me personally, if I did that, it would ruin a lot of the fun for me, I think. Yeah. 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 And also, dude, you know, everyone has the answers. Everyone thinks they know and they don't, you just, you just don't. Um, everyone told me not to do this show. They said, make another channel. It'll kill your watch time or whatever, or engagement. I don't know what it is. Average watch time. Is that what it's called? Yeah. It's like, um, the, the algorithm supposedly it, it, it'll, if you have longer form videos and the, uh, engagement with longer form videos is usually less. So mm. it'll throw off 
off your watch times and that's the theory anyway but i don't i don't think anyone really knows exactly how it works they don't they don't and uh, i think people think it's a lot more nefarious than it is um and i say that also as someone who works in development i <laughs> the algorithm like people act like it's this big like big brother that it's it's not and um yeah i have a lot of thoughts about that stuff but it's probably not worth me ranting about um but everyone told me not to do it because of that and i did it anyways because i don't care and look this channel absolutely has grown i mean we're i think i'm almost halfway to I think I'm like 72 or 7,300 and I just hit 7,000 like a week ago. So like I'm on my way to 8,000 and I'm just doing what I want. And none of this would be happening without chatting with nuts. Chatting with nuts without a doubt was the catalyst without a doubt. Yeah. I, would have you, I wanted to tell you congratulations on 7,000. That's a huge accomplishment. Thanks, man. It's uh, I told you before we went live, it's weird, dude. <laughs> Cause like sometimes I forget how many people watch and listen, like, you know, two to 3,000 people are going to watch this. And I was saying how BookTube would BookTube.com wouldn't be too big, but that would fill out a small concert venue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We might need a Staples Center, man. Might need a, might, might need a stadium. Yeah, it's it is. I mean, it is wild when you think about it. But yeah, it is. Uh, and then you you always wonder who's watching. You know, like who. Oh yeah. But it's it's the engagement. Is that's why I think uh, you know live streams like this are so much fun because. We get a ch chance to engage with people watching, and um, then you get to, you get to know people, and, and you get to feel like you're part of the part of the process. And and once people get to know you, I think they they you know we kind of connect, and we feel like, and we, you know we connect with viewers too, people who comment or whatever. And when someone has like a positive comment, like hey, I really enjoyed this video, it like makes my day. It's like that's yeah. awesome. It doesn't seem like much, but it goes a long way. Just something just as simple as that. Yeah, especially uh, in when you read things that are very personal to people, um, berserk is a very intense series. And some of the comments that I've had and how forthcoming people are with some of the trauma they've been through and what, and what they get out of people analyzing it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very heavy stuff. I mean, it's a very, um, a deep rooted connection to, to some people that you can have, uh, when connecting over works that are really, um, uh, what's sort of like impactful, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, you know, it's very formative, not only as readers, but as human beings a lot of the time. And I think, you know, you and I read a lot of the darker stuff and those tend to go into a lot more of the traumatic themes um, and, and a lot of the deeper stuff in the human mind. So everyone comes from a different experience, too. Right. Yeah. Some people would ask, like, why would you ever read that? And for some people, they say, hey, this might just be oohs and ahs and gross for you. And this is my reality. Uh, that's heavy stuff. And that's a that's a super valid way of engaging with uh, art. And people can discount it for uh, shock and gore and all this stuff. But it's sometimes it's a lot more than that. And I think for the most part, it is. Mm. So um, it also depends on where you are and how you how where you in your life or what's going on with you when you read a book or when you absorb mm -hmm. any kind of art. And what you read, it may not like today. You may enjoy months from now when you may, your head is in a different place. So Go it all depends. Exactly, dude. The Gunslinger by Stephen King. I read it the first time and I said, eh, that was boring. That was 2016. I read it uh, last year. I read Dark Tower and I was like, I love the Gunslinger. Like, I love it. And um, I mean, I would have probably given it the first time like two or three stars. And then the second time I was like, man, I can only give this like four and a half or five stars. And then after you finish the series, uh, all of the books get better, in my opinion. But, um, you know, I was just a different person then. I wasn't really reading a lot in 2016. Um, but now after kind of getting my taste, you know, kind of ironed out, I realized I kind of like pretentious books. Gunslinger is a little bit pretentious. I like you, it. You, know, you like House of Leaves. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be up my alley, dude. I, I really think it would be. Um, and Ash and Sand, I know you brought that up a lot by uh, Richard Nell. Is it Nell? Richard Nell? Yeah, I'm very curious to read that. There's four or five people in my Discord right now reading it. They have a read along. They try to get me in it, but I was like, I, guys, I can't fit that in right now. I just can't. Um, the next big read along that I have scheduled is I'm going to be doing Janie Wart's uh, Wars of Light and Shadow with Philip and AP. Really? Yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, I got to meet Janie down in at ICFA as well. She stopped by. Uh, she dropped off some really funny shirts. It said, "Be nice," or the next uh, my next novel, you'll die or something. Like it's just super ridiculous. But um, I got to meet her in person. She was just absolutely wonderful, like you said, very passionate. A uh, person who has a very uh, intense vision of what she wants out of her work and what she hopes to achieve with it. And I think it's really uh, commendable. 
And uh, yeah, we were talking and we said, we think this is probably a series we should dive into. Cause a lot of people say it's as complex as Malazan. Mm-hmm. So are you starting, really? the, starting the whole series? Yeah, I think we're going to do literally the entire thing. Um, mm-hmm. I really wanted to read the Empire Trilogy before, even though I know that it has nothing to do with it and it's Feist and her. But like I, the Empire Trilogy is its own thing. Like I'm so interested in it for other reasons. Um, and then I really want to read To Ride Hell's Chasm, her standalone. I thought that would be kind of cool. But I might just end up diving in with Wars of Light and Shadow. I'm still going to read the Empire Trilogy this year. Uh, but Wars of Light and Shadow is the next like big series that I'm doing. So. Mm. I'm going to have to jump on that one. Yeah, dude. Uh, I think we're going to try to do a book a month. Uh, the first one's it's thick. But then after that, they're a little bit more manageable. I've heard that uh, her writing is gorgeous, but very dense. Mm-hmm. So you take your time with it. Like, it, you know, it's a, it's like Malazan. Like, you're not yeah. going to sprint through it. I say that, but I read Malazan in 10 months. But I was obsessed wow. with it. You know, it wasn't that I was trying to just get through it. I was just obsessed with it. You know, I just wanted more answers. Because I'm the kind of person, if I get confused, dude, I want to, I, I get curious i don't get mad you know i think that's why i struggled the first time reading gardens of the moon because i was so confused that i i felt like i should know what's happening and i didn't know what the hell was going on so i it would like bother me like what am i missing why don't i know what's happening so yeah i think uh it it broke me of needing to know every detail because a lot of fantasy it's all about knowing all the details and like for instance like dandelion dynasty for the most part there is some in in there's ambiguous parts with the gods in there that are really cool, actually. Uh, but, you know, he gives you a ton of info of, like, why this person does this and why they do that. So it's, like, the opposite of that, right? Like, it's just, like, you have to be comfortable not knowing um, and then being able to pick up on little context clues. And I think it made it easier to read other books in a lot in a lot of ways. So yeah. I'm curious to see what happens with Wars of Light and Shadow. Hmm. Yeah, but we t- I don't know if it was on stream or before we started, but Jenny did mention that she had met all of you and how wonderful you all were, so... <laughs> yeah she actually messaged me because we were going back and forth um about some stuff and she said that she had a great time uh doing the interview with you and i could check it out and said that she had mentioned uh the the meeting so oh. yeah yeah she's great and she's also uh i think it's uh under the radar books and blaze over there um has also done a little bit of correspondence with her and done an episode or an interview with her as well and people said it was awesome you know people like hearing Janie talk and i think she's just one of those people who has kind of went under the radar like she's kind of flown under everybody um and for various reasons that she's explained um but i'm hoping that i'll love this series and that we can breathe some life into this thing you know definitely and on, on that interview i just tried to not say anything stupid and not interrupt her because she you know, I just she would just talk, and I would just try to just be quiet and just listen to her because just absorb all the all the goodness, all the Jenny goodness. Yeah, um, and, and that's the best part. And we talked about this uh, before we went on. The best interviews are where you don't have to talk much, and you just kind of you just let them flow and give give so, giving someone the opportunity to get something uh, that they've had on their heart or their mind, um, you know, and get it out. It, it's it's pretty powerful stuff. It's really yeah. good. I think a lot of times Alan comes on and Alan just wants to, he is just a ball of energy and he just wants to get out some thoughts he's had in his mind. And this is where he can do it. Right. (laughs) And uh, I, I I like being that for people. I would love, I I will definitely probably have Janny on for chatting with nuts at some point. That'd be great. Yeah. I would say. And I do know that Philip, uh, Philip and AP and I have said that we would like to bring Janny on after books and talk just like they did with Erickson. We want to do that with Janie as well and give her an opportunity to talk about the book and where she was with it and what she wanted to get out of it. And um, she, you know, it's funny. She told me, she's like, you know, don't sprint through these. Like she's very um, hands-on whenever talking about the approach to reading her big, you know, amazing Epic series. So she has a lot of passion. It's awesome. Oh yeah. It's, it's really contagious. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think it's going to be a good time. I have, I have a lot of, um, a lot of people who I know and I trust that have told me that it's going to be a hit for me. So hmm. that'll be good. Also, Erickson speaks very highly of Janie. Hmm. How far ahead do you plan your reading? So it's not like every single thing is every always filled out. Um, but, you know, I make that top eight or 10 list for the year. And I, and I, I arbitrarily put a lot of pressure on myself to finish those things. Um, so those are like the only for sure things, right? Like it's like those have to be read. So I'd say that's my planned reading. Now, the problem with the top eight is that it's eight books, but each entry could be a trilogy, could be a 10 book series. You know what I mean? So it's not really eight books. It's probably more like 20 books. Um, 
I can read anywhere between three to six books a month right now. Uh, and I've actually slowed down on purpose a little bit. One, I'm busy, but like two, I just want to kind of savor things a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to shoot for like three to four books right now. Um, so out of those, I would say two to three are planned. Uh, and then the random Patreon pick of the month is always like insane because I can just get a thousand page chunker out of nowhere. You know, it's I'm, I'm at the mercy of, of the raffle. So I don't ever, never know what's going to happen. I'm reading Sheep Farmer's Daughter by Elizabeth Moon, I believe is her name. I hope I got that right. I'm so excited about it. I think it's going to be so cool. The cover's like like a sheep farmer's daughter, like with a battle axe or something. I'm like, this is going to be cool. Like, something different. And also, that's an author that you know has been around for a while and people don't talk about a ton. But like I know people who have read that book and really, really like it. So I love that about the Patreon wheel is that it forces me out of my comfort zone. Like I got read Good Omens by Terry Pratch and Neil Gaiman. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Library of Mount Char by Scott Hawkins or Dawkins. I can't remember. Someone can correct me. Um, like that was a lot of fun. I read the gray bastards by Jonathan French last month for my patron will. Um, and I liked that. That was a good book. Um, it wasn't like the perfect book, but I thought it was really, really good. It was fun. Um, yeah. You interviewed Jonathan French, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're doing a, a series kind of discussion here in May or June. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like it was like it was like silly fun. Yeah, yeah. I some of the humor missed with me because like it was a lot of like sexually explicit stuff in the book, and some it was like chapter by chapter. Like one chapter would hit, the next would miss. But when you talk about the world he built and what he was doing, like the actual plot, I thought it was really fun. Yeah. And I'll finish that trilogy probably not this year, but books two and three are definitely on my radar to finish up next year. Yeah, I think uh, he. And that was it was curious because it, it doesn't feel like a big world until you could finish it and then it felt like oh that is he did build a lot but you didn't feel like you didn't sometimes you can tell that the, okay this is some world building that's happening right now but yeah. i didn't really get that with the great bastards it just kind of happened yeah the lays of the land like how the world works and not necessarily like this is this town this is it but like in the political landscape that's kind of set up, i just liked it i thought it was cool i thought it was inventive uh i like the sons of anarchy parallels i mean they're very very prevalent in this book yeah. uh, to to a degree where i would almost say it's distracting if you're a fan of sons of anarchy because you're like thinking about sons of anarchy at the time uh, like now i kind of want to rewatch the show to be honest um uh, but i liked it it was endearing again derivative things or inspired things i like um, yeah. So I, I dug it. I actually thought Gray Bastards was because um, that was self-published, right? At first, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it was and then uh, it was picked up traditional and then it went to an editor and it got uh, kind of cleaned up a little bit and then it was released traditionally. Yeah, uh, that doesn't surprise me at all because uh, there's a lot of really good stuff there. And I thought his writing was good. I thought it was like solid, like his prose was good. Um, so like that's one I would have, dude, I would have not picked that up in five years. You know, I have so much stuff. I haven't read name of the wind yet. Like I got other stuff I want to read that I've been dying to get to. So the random patron wheel is like my favorite thing. <laughs> it's like my absolute favorite thing. And I haven't had any stinkers yet. So that's good. Yeah. You're dodging some bullets there. <laughs> I've had books that didn't click like send Linda sends good book. Not for me. Oh, well, interesting. But, but like, cool. Well, that. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, it's weird. I did. I, I don't remember if I did a review. I think I just talked about a wrap up, but like there was nothing in it that I said, Oh, that's terrible. Or that's bad. It just like, I ended the book and I just didn't care to know what happened next. And I never got attached to the characters. And I just said, Oh, this one's just not for me. Um, it is what it is. The only thing I could say is there was a part of it where like, I need you to do this for me. Okay. But first go fetch these things. And it kind of felt like a video game side quest mm. and like very on the nose. Uh, but again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, you know, you got to, you can't just go linear, you know, you got to divert and I get it. I get it. Um, so yeah, Sinland sends a book that not necessary for me, but I think it's a good book, hmm. you know? So, and even that, right. Like I actually wanted to get to Sinland. I was very excited about it and I don't know when I would have got to, it, but my one on my patron will, and there it is. Nice. So it's cool. How is, how is patron is that a lot of time for you to, to manage? It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> All right. So my patron is very cut and dry because like I will never try to overpromise and under deliver. I think that's like one of the worst things you can do as a content creator. And I was always very nervous about doing a patron anyways, uh, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, I never wanted the public discord because I get a lot of anxiety uh, thinking about hundreds of people uh chatting i don't i don't know why like i've been in big discord servers and they always start out small and they're really cool and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger now there's some that stay in the sweet spot like which i think is like 200 or less 
but I feel strange just having it open to the public. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why. Um, also, that's a lot of notifications. I'm already on my phone too much, right? Um, and also, whenever you have a smaller group, you get to know people. And I want to get yeah. to know people. Uh, I, I love the people that are my patron discord. Like they're, they're my friends. Like we talk about books, but we talk about life and work all the time. You know, there's people trying to help other people get jobs with it's, it's crazy. It's, it's really fun. Yeah. Um, but Patreon, basically, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty basic, right? Like $3 is just like supporting. So that's the bottom tier. And then any, everyone gets access to the discord. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I said, okay, well, what can I do for a second tier? And I said, okay, they can submit to the random book. So at second tier, you can start recommending books and they get put on the wheel. And then the third one is the same exact thing, but they get to do a video. We do a video chat once a month, oh, cool. which are, I mean, it's like this, it's a chatting with nuts, but with like 20 people. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> so, so I'm not sitting there saying I'm going to give you exclusive content. Um, so it does require time. I mean, those chats can go three hours sometimes, oh. you know, four hours. Um, but it's all very realistic things that I know I can deliver on, and I don't push it hard. I try not to, at least. Uh, yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I never thought I would have this many patrons. That's the more scary thing is like how many people want to support which is very generous and i'm I'm humbled by it but it's like oh wow like this is getting big like my read off at the beginning of my videos is getting almost 30 seconds long and i'm like i might have to switch i might have to start shouting out the names at the end like during the end credits because like if i have a minute intro of me reading names you know that's people people hate that kind of thing so yeah that's eventually one day that's probably going to be thing i have to change um but yeah um I had a lot of other people tell me like if you if you want to do a Patreon, like there's nothing wrong with it, right? Yeah. Uh, but my biggest thing is I never want people to think this is about money or anything. And all the money that comes from Patreon goes right back into the channel. Uh, yeah. I am still 100% in the red. <laughs> <laughs> this Mac Mini was very expensive. The camera, you know, and, but I'm not complaining. You know, if I'll stay in the red. I don't care. Um, it's, it's never been about the money. But people are very generous and uh, people like supporting things. I support a lot of people on Patreon. You know, I, I, I like it. Uh, well, what people are willing to put their time into, I think, deserves um, recognition if, if you feel so inclined, right? Yeah. I, I would be nervous just to one day to say, um, I'm, I'm kind of done with this. And then you have people that depend. That would feel that kind of pressure. Like, that's what I would be a little worried about. Personally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. But, you know, if you stop, you know, you just stop charging, you know, and it, it's over. You know, that happens all the time. Uh, you know, you can have a subscription service and the company closes. And I, I think also people just understand um you know it is you're a human being and and things like that i mean ironically if i were to ever to quit booktube i would just keep my discord uh like i wouldn't obviously have a patreon for it but like i would just keep those people in there because i love talking to them. <laughs> you know i wake up talk to them and uh you know they, they know how my day is going uh it's cool it's very cool That's, yeah and it is nice to have that little close-knit kind of community and not a bunch of noise yeah it, too big and it's it's you kind of get lost in the shuffle and it's hard to Hard to connect with people when there's so many people. Yeah. And another thing is, dude, um, you know, I don't make videos for every book I read. Right. So it is also a way of people are like, oh, I like I want to talk to you about the books you're reading. Like they can come in and do that. And I I used to use Twitter a lot, but like I just don't have time. And, and you get like a lot of noise. Right. So it, it's a place where like you can go express your book opinions and it's about books and it's scoped and you're not reading a feed of like a bazillion people you never even followed. And you know, it's more curated and more personable. And also, I like watching people make friends in the Discord. Like, I have people who never met before, and then they meet, and then they become friends. And I just think that's, like, incredible. It makes me, it legitimately makes my day sometimes, where I see two people having a full-blown conversation I've never met until that moment. It's, like, my favorite thing. It's so cool. Hmm. Also, Darren, thanks for the 10 spot, man. He says, Patreon chats are so much fun. Yeah. You know, and I know there's some people who say, oh, well, you only have a Discord for your patrons. Like, you're like, are you trying to charge people to talk to you? No, it's literally because I can't fathom the idea of having like a thousand people in a discord. It gives me so much anxiety because I feel like if my name's on it. It represents me and I can't control who comes in, who goes out, who's going to, you know, troll or do something terror. You know, it's tough. And I've seen that happen to people too. Yeah, And your name's on it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think a lot of people have discords or, you know, those kind of, uh, ways to connect and they don't pay attention to it and then it gets out of control and it mm -hmm. it just looks bad if you let that happen that's it's also right. inevitable uh that you're going to grow and you're going to get bigger and i think that's like one of the weirdest things about this and one of the reasons why um 
I'm trying to understand where this is all going because if I continue to do this, I will continue to grow. Um, whether I'm consciously trying to do that and looking at analytics or not, if I continue to do what I do, um, I'm not saying I'll have a million subs or a hundred thousand, but Hey, the jump from 1000 to 7,000 was a lot. I spent a lot. I spent hours a week replying to comments. Oh yeah. And what's that going to look like at 20,000? Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting thing, right? Yeah. Um, You're on your yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's awesome. And, and I'm very proud of that. And, uh, mostly it's just because people are really kind and, and share the word out. Um, they do more promotion for me than, than myself, but I do wonder like, what is it going to feel like at 20,000? Um, like even keeping up with chat has become, I've had to get better at it because <laughs> there's some nights, man, when we have like a hundred some people, it's like flying by. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It takes, it, it's, it's tough to keep up. I think that's another thing that takes a lot of, uh, that's why it's to, to carry a conversation and pay attention to the chat can get, sometimes it can get a little, you have to kind of keep up because otherwise it's, yeah. you know, you want to include everyone. Yeah. And it's also feeling out, um, you know, sometimes the ch the conversation's so good that chat will take a backseat. Sometimes the chat's so good that the conversation takes the backseat. So it's fun to kind of feel out that dynamic. And that's what I offer, I think. I think I do an okay job at this. And uh, I, I like I like the challenge. I like the mm -hmm. challenge. I like being live. And I like being held accountable for things I say off the top of my head, apparently. Uh, like that I didn't like that I didn't watch Alien. I'm going to regret that. You need to rewatch Sons of Anarchy and instead watch Alien. Okay, fair enough. Sons of Anarchy, like last three seasons, weren't good anyway. So, no, the, and the last season was really bad. Yeah, I uh, I think I watched the finale and I was like, eh, but I did not like anything after season three. I think the first two, three seasons I really, really liked, um, while also like knowing it was kind of silly. Like the whole time I was like, it's kind of silly. Yeah, yeah, kind of like Dexter. I think Dexter should have ended after season three. I so I like Trinity, so I would do four. Oh, yeah, is that oh, was Trinity four? That, that was John three? Lithgow, John Lithgow season four, and I think it's one of the best seasons of television ever. Yes, uh, yeah, after that season, after the Jimmy that, Smith season, right? Yes, right. And then the writing strike happened, they lost all their writers, and oh. the show went to shit. Oh, it was a writing strike. Okay, that's what happened. Yes, there. that happened. Uh, uh, some other shows that actually happened on, and I can't remember what they were. But I know Breaking Bad maintained all their writers. Oh, mm -hmm. True Blood. True Blood lost all their original writers as well. And True Blood was very highly rated and then just whoop, fell off. Uh, same exact thing happened there. Oh, wow. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, the writing strike for Dexter was detrimental. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, no one, that, that explains a lot. Yeah, the Trinity season was really very good. It's such a good ending. I tell people, my wife actually watched and I said, just stop at season four. And she was like, really? And I said, like, yeah. And she's like, wow, that was such a good ending. I want to know what happens next. I go, no, 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 just be at peace. And she's like, well, what happened? I told her what happens at the end. And she was like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you don't want to watch this. It's a train wreck. I just saved you like 30 hours. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, for real. And a lot of a lot of head scratching and shaking of the head. Yeah. I've, I have heard of Yellowstone is very good. Sons of Anarchy for Cowboy. I've, yeah, I've had a lot of people recommend Yellowstone for me. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about it. I will haunt you to as you watch Alien. That's <laughs> such a good movie. I'm really looking forward to that Dead House Gates discussion. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm I'm excited to watch through all your Malazan content and watch as you go. If you ever uh if you ever want to chat about it, let me know, dude. I'm always down to collab. Uh and I'm always down to talk Malazan. Let me know. Well, uh, you're you're always welcome anytime. Yeah, man. I I uh I will never get tired of talking about Malazan. <laughs> Tomorrow at um, 1 p.m. Eastern. So you're welcome to come along. I, I'll shoot you the link if you want to. I'll come. tell you what. I'm, I may be able to swing it. It depends on if we're walking another house or not. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> make it cool. If not, then no problem. Cool, man. Well, we've done about three hours, and uh, everyone's been riding with us this whole time. This has been super chill, man. Uh, this is the first time me and Steve have ever really talked, by the way. I hit up Steve on April 1st, and he said, I said, hey, would you like to come on? And he said, is this an April Fool's joke? And I was like, am I that big of a dick? <laughs> it was little, it, I've never been invited on another book, uh, booktube channel like this before. So uh, I, I kind of like I saw that you had popped up and I looked at the calendar. I thought, no, I don't, I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think this would be an April Fool's. I just have to make sure because I was surprised, but pleasantly surprised. I was excited. So, 
Yeah, man. No, I think you're doing a great thing on your channel. Uh, you know, I think uh, within a very small amount of time, you're going to see a lot of growth. Uh, I like other people that are doing long form stuff. Uh, it's what I'm passionate about. And it's where I've kind of dug out my it's where I dug my heels in and seeing other people go and do these interviews, especially. Uh, that's something that I think that you're excellent at that. I wish I was better at. Um, so it's cool to watch and learn from you in that regard. And also, we like a lot of the same shit. So that's awesome. <laughs> I don't know, you do a pretty good job at interviews. So this is it, this takes a lot to to carry a conversation for this long. So you do a great job. I appreciate that, man. Uh, I want you to tell everyone where they can find you on the internet. Oof. Okay, so the uh, the best place is on our. We have a forum called PageChewing.com. We have a, that's kind of like our. I our love it. Discord, uh, and then I can be found on Twitter that I try to avoid pay at Steve Talks Books, and I have like Instagram and Facebook that I never check because I don't get it. But those are the best places to find me. And of course, yeah. yeah, and your YouTube is Steve Talks Books, right? Right, yeah. And it's down in the description. So everyone, I'm telling you, go check out Steve's videos. Um, if you like this show, you're going to like a lot of the stuff that he's doing. And he has some really amazing recommends for stuff that you probably haven't heard of in the self-pub realm. And I think that that is uh, something that a lot of people could get really into because there's a lot of stuff in the niche that you've never thought of. Uh, like if you could think of an idea, it's probably been written about. Uh, so go check that out down in the description. I do want to ask you something. So you have forums, which I love because I grew up on forums. Yeah. Um, did, did you do like some sort of hosting service for that? Did like, are you a web developer? Did you do it yourself? Like, uh, well, I have a, a, I have a, I, so I, I purchased, I have the hosting for it and then I installed the forums on there. Um, cool. it, the forum has been around since 2004. We've just had different variations of it for different topics. So it's been like a little group that's come along for the past, gosh, long while now 18 years we're almost almost old enough to vote so that's awesome uh, dude. Yeah, it's been around for a while time for a, for a while and at one point we even lost the the host i had lost all my lost all the heart the drive it was on failed or something i lost everything i had to start over again so now i had to get a new host and install the forums again but yeah it's it's been around for a while yeah that's awesome man um because uh, I do web development, so I've been actually kicking around the idea of starting some sort of community site. And I saw that you had forums, and I was like, "That's just such an awesome thing," um, and a throwback because that's what I grew up on, yeah. you know. And I also remember getting on the old uh, Song of Ice and Fire forums back in a couple years back, and that was a good throwback too. So I thought that was really cool. Oh, cool! Yeah, if you need any, if you need any help, I can, you know, let me know if I can help you with anything. Cool, man. I appreciate it. Um, everyone hit like on this video. It helps people find it after the fact. And please go down in the description, click on Steve's channel link and go subscribe to him. Um, I would love to see some massive growth from my boy here. Um, you've been an absolute pleasure to talk to Steve. Oh, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. It's been a ton of fun. The three hours have flown by. So thank it, it you. really did. I looked up and I was like, damn, <laughs> that's how I know it's a good episode. Uh, we'll do it again, dude. We'll do it again for sure. Anytime, let me know, and I'll shoot you that link for tomorrow. Just if you, if you can make it. If not, no problem. Absolutely, man. Um, I will do my very best. And chat, thank you for showing up. Always the best third guest. And we will be back in two weeks with another episode of Chatting with Nuts with another Nick guest. And it'll be a lot of fun. Make sure to check out that big Charity Jeopardy episode on Alan's channel this Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern. It's for a good cause. Uh, and we're going to have a lot of fun with that. And I think it's going to be uh, one of the best live shows of all time. I really believe that. Um, so, Steve. I'll see you soon. Uh, thank you again, my friend. Chat, thank you. Uh, and everyone, be good, be safe. And remember to always keep turning the page.